Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Stephen Haas. Uh, he's got an awesome YouTube channel, which you should check out. Uh, <laughs> Steve, I don't know if you want to plug that now. Sure, yeah. I have a, a YouTube channel. Uh, if you just search Stephen Haas, it'll come up. Um, and I make uh, pick and place machines and like sometimes some other wacky projects. It's pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, <laughs> been to his shop. It's awesome. <laughs> well, so Steve, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Awesome. I appreciate it. So I know you wanted to kind of get into the pick and place maybe to start. You wanna you wanna grill down that road, see where it takes us. Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Sweet. Yeah. So I in like I think it was 2019. I did a Kickstarter for a light up bow tie. Nice. And the glow tie. The glow tie. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had a, like a very modest goal, and I only had to make a hundred of them, and I had to solder all the components by hand to Yourself. make just yeah. How many? How many did you move? A hundred. It was a hundred glow ties, so okay. it was like oh, three thousand components or so by hand that I had to solder and all through hole surface mount. They were foundation. almost all uh, surface mount. And I, for the first half, I did them all like soldering iron by hand. Yeah, I kind of like that, but you don't want to do that at scale at all. <sighs> you know, that was exactly the trade-off I had because I was yeah. doing them by hand and I like doing it's it by zen. hand. Yeah. It's super zen. It's great. And then I was like, okay, I'm not going to be able to keep up. Like I have to get these things out the door. So right. I finally got a stencil and I did the solder paste thing. Nice. Um, and I put them in my little freaking toaster oven that I, you know, set up to like do the reflow and all that. And that worked better, but it still sucked. Yeah, it was not sense. it was not great. So at the end of this, I was like, "How much is a pick and place to have this happen <laughs> for me?" And like, you're looking at sixty grand minimum for like a reasonable thing. You can get like a Neo Den, which is like twenty k nowadays. Interesting, but it's expensive, and yeah. like the software isn't great, and like it's hard to get it to do weird stuff, and like get it to program your stuff too. And that makes other sense. when you at the low end of any kind of tool, right? I mean, the software is not going to be great because yeah. it's such an expense to do in terms of not recurrent engineering. Totally, yeah, absolutely, and like. And it's a weird thing of like trying to figure out how to populate components. Like there's machine vision, there's like generating G code and like tool pathing and like there's weird stuff going on in there. It's like, it's not straightforward <laughs> yeah, writing sense. something like that. So I actually haven't done it personally, but I can imagine uh, just based on the fact that there's so many industries that exist around it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's a lot. So I was like, okay, so I could either like pay someone through the nose to get them populated like at some assembly shop or buy a pick and place, or I could do them hand soldering. And I don't want to hand solder them, I don't want to pay through the nose, I don't want to buy a pick and place. Let me try and make a cheaper one with effectively just like using all the hardware that you use in an FDM printer, like stepper motors and like a standard off the shelf like 3D printer controller oh, and, interesting. and like 3D printer firmware. It's effectively doing the same thing. You have to do some weird stuff to get it to work, but like a 3D printer is not tremendously different from a pick and place. There are other things you have to add in, but like with the cool hardware boom of like FDM printers, yep. stepper motor cost came down, linear rail cost came down, a GT2 timing belt cost, like all this, the little yep. dreeblies you need, so much cheaper. That's so awesome. I was like, why don't I just try and do that and make a pick and place? So that's been the past year or so of my life. That's cool. How far are you along? Like what do you, what do you got running? Uh, so I have, um, like it works. Okay. It's not super smooth. But it does the job. That makes sense. Yeah, it's like it's so I have a whole list of milestones and stuff of like trust stuff I'm trying to hit. Where do you keep that track of that? Like, I, this is going to be a lot of tangents. So. I, I'm super about it. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> um, I have a really uh, detailed wiki on my GitHub page. Nice. Um, GitHub's and, great. You use, you use it the issues or? I do. GitHub issues are awesome. That's such a great way to run. Things. They're honestly awesome. It, it gets weird because like I'll make a GitHub issue and it's for something that I know is a problem or like one of the developers on the project knows is a problem and that's great. And yeah. then some random person that watches a YouTube video and like briefly looks at the CAD will just go to GitHub and be like, this is a problem. And it's like, oh, well, you know, it's not really a problem. We've decided that we don't want this to be what this product is, you know? So it's so weird. So it's more of like a, a, cust a user story than it is like a, a development milestone. Well, well, it's both because yeah. we're trying to use it as like like a project management and project tracking, but yeah. other people will just drop stuff in there. So it's kind of like an inbox and project tracking. Do you consider closing it to the public? I really don't want to do that. That makes sense. Because it's like, it's a very, very open project. My Discord server around the YouTube channel has like 1,600 people in it and like, a, like there's probably 30 or 40 people building an index right now. That's pretty right slick now. that you've got access to that many people that want to work on a project. Because I'm, this is not going to be popular with your viewers, I don't think. But I'm a big closed source guy. <laughs> and so, but I mean like SKA, my, my company I work for gets hired to, you know, basically, I mean we work on a lot of stuff where the clients have stringent confidentiality requirements and they're trying to beat other companies to market. Yeah. And I mean that sounds really like greedy and capitalistic to somebody in the open source world, but 
the reality is, I mean, you know, it's like these people are spending and these companies are spending so much money to, to yeah. try to be the first one there. Yep. And if we put it on blast for the world, I mean, it would it would really be a, just a disservice to our clients. Yeah. So. Yep. I, I and like I don't I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with closed source. Well, and so I've been coming around to open source. I used to be like really? a really super closed source kind of. You know, like, so what, what pulled you around then? What was the like, okay, I can kind of see this. I think, honestly, OBS that we're using to record this podcast mm. right now is a great piece of software that's yeah. open source. I, I, I love it. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, there's a few other projects that I've just really, really enjoyed. I mean, the fact that like the whole Linux ecosystem came out of open source, like, yeah. it's nothing to scoff at, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there's there's a bunch of uh, projects that I just have a lot of respect for that are, that are open source. And so... You know, I, I think as, as humans, we go through this journey where, like, you know, we're idealistic and then we kind of open up to, like, okay, you know, maybe the world's pretty gray. Like, it's not just shades of black and white. And mm. so it's easy to be, like, you know, like, just, you know, you know, Mr. Capitalist douchebag. I love, <laughs> you know, like, helping companies earn more profit. But then, you know, you also have to see the other side, which is, you know, people want to build things as yeah. a community. And that's awesome, too. And that can also create utility in the world. I yeah. use GIMP to edit images, I yeah. mean, for instance, right? yep. like rather yeah. than Photoshop. Right. I used Photoshop in high school. I liked it quite a lot then. Yeah. These days, I, I prefer GIMP. Yep. So, you mm -hmm. know, I, I think having that flexibility is great. And I think just keeping an open mind to the merits of, of every sort of paradigm of development is, is a great way to do it. Sure. I, I totally agree. Like I'm actually putting out these apps under the Creative Commons license. Are you really? YouTube license. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, Thanks. cool. That's pretty <laughs> rad, man. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I just decided to do it like a few days ago. Really? Yeah. That's cool. Seemed like a better way to run it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And like, I, I, I totally agree. Like there are some things where closed source makes a lot of sense and like, I won't, I won't blame anyone for deciding to do a closed source thing because it depends on what your goal is. Like my goal is not to like freaking like, I don't know, like some demolish everybody. And like, I want to make stuff that helps people yeah. build circuit boards and like, that makes sense. And like, but that just happens to be my very niche interest. So yeah. like open source works for me, but it doesn't for everybody. Well, and like demolish everybody. I don't think that's a fair view of closed source or capital because like nobody. Sure. Like, okay, so there, this is how it, like, this is actually a really interesting conversation. So okay. <laughs> I, I have a mentor that refers to it as, as ethical capitalism. Okay. You know, so, like, you don't want to screw people over. You don't want to be dishonest. Yep. Um, you know, like, deceit is generally discouraged, but you can still be competitive. Yeah. So, competition in some ways, I mean, the incentive that derives from that really can, I mean, like, the space shuttle, like, the... The fact that we put a person on the moon, you yeah, know, I mean, yeah. a lot of people paid a lot of money to do those things, yeah. you know, and yeah. like, I mean, you know, right now SpaceX is doing some really cool stuff, you know, where I used to work at. Yep. And so, um, like, I don't know, all, all those are for-profit businesses that are, that are doing good things for humanity, but at the same time, yep. like you said, I mean, you know, if you leverage open source, you can do that too. So I think it's just a yeah. different way to the same goal. I, I, I agree. That, that's a good point. Like, uh, uh, associating it with demolishing someone is not necessarily representative of how people Some people act that way. And so th there are there are some people that are really unethical, yeah. I think, in, in business. And, and, you know, I do interact with people like that, and I... I don't enjoy interacting. I mean, sometimes <laughs> yeah. I do if I if I can best them at something. It's a little bit satisfying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> getting their goat a little bit. Yeah, or just you know getting the better of them in like a contract negotiation. If somebody's like a little bit too cocky, and then you can, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe maybe that's not the best thing to say, but it, it's oh, a little whatever. It's kind of fun to you know to I, I sort of enjoy it a little bit. Like, sure. Yeah, yeah. So. I I think like I I I think it can be a tool. Like I'm still gonna try and sell the picking places, and like that's inherently capitalistic. Like, like, yeah. In order to you gotta pay I, the rent, I mean, I, uh, exactly. Like we live mortgage, in a world guess, where yeah. money is necessary, yeah. and the way that you get that is by selling things and selling goods and services. Like we're kind of stuck in this methodology. So yeah. in order to make something profitable, you kind of do have to play the game a little bit. But like the way that um, you know, I have my problems with Elon Musk, but like yeah, sure, I work for the guy. He, he yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but one thing of his that I I do quite like is you know he. I, I don't know, and I, I'm not entirely sure this is correct. I heard this, so it could be incorrect. But, you know, he's trying to make Teslas to put the fire under Ford's ass to be like, electric cars are a thing. And, like, look, I'm competition. Come on. I dare you to fight me. Here are all my patents. I promise you that I will not enforce them. 
Go ahead, take my patents. I want the competition because I don't care about being the best electric car company. That's I care about electric cars proliferating. He said that of Blue Origin when I was at SpaceX. This would have oh, maybe I'm getting confused with SpaceX then. Well, he might have said that to Ford too. I don't because I mean you know he's a guy and so he probably has his preferences. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd assume his behaviors, you know, cross into different endeavors of his. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. And so, like, yeah. I don't know. I would imagine he runs. Tesla them both the same is well probably not the same it's it's probably a little different because te- spacex is privately held and tesla's publicly traded so he's beholden to a board for tesla yeah that's true and, and i think the companies have different goals and so i mean i'm not i'm not him i don't know what's in his mind yeah. but if i had to guess it would be that like tesla is almost a way, way to finance spacex which is really his passion project yeah yeah uh, but and, and there's probably other bits to it as well but that, that's like a simplification yeah 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 but yeah, I mean, the, the idea of like, I'm doing it because I want to create competition for a thing that I think is important and should be in the world is yeah. an interesting ethos. Like using yeah. capitalism as like a pressure on other people to yeah. try and jump on board with a movement is kind of interesting. And, and that I, for sure is a big part of what he's trying to do at SpaceX, I yeah. believe. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. And I just saw it closer up. I, I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, you definitely did. did. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it's weird, but like you know, closed source has a place. Like sometimes closed source software is way better, sometimes it's not. And like Blender is a great example. Blender is the most beautiful, lovely, complicated, awesome piece of software. It's open source, right? and it's completely open source. Yeah. But so yeah, for me, it's like okay, cool. It's like I want to. I, I like the idea of it being open, and and also like I'm broke and I want to use free software. Yeah, I mean like, <laughs> that's also small part of it. Over here too. So exactly, we but then money wherever we can. You also have the ability to hack it. Like in in the pick and place, we're using uh, two main big chunks of open source software: um, Marlin, the three D printer firmware, and yep. OpenPMP, which is software written to pretty much control any pick and place that you might want to that's plug awesome. into it. And we have on my my little dev team of, of uh, open source contributors that are working on the nice. project. They're, they're making changes in those other open source projects to support the index picking place. That's awesome. So like if, if I went to like, if I wanted to make a change in Maya and like, hey, I want to make this 3D modeling software different, they're going to tell me to go pound sand. But if I yeah, go to Blender and I'm like, here, look, I have this change. Here's a pull request. Why wouldn't they approve it? Like why wouldn't they support something else? So That's part awesome. of it is you can hack it. You can play around with it. You can modify it. You can meet the people who write it, and like, yeah, you know, you, you can change it to do what you want. How do and you keep I love those? That. So okay, so I didn't mean to. That's awesome. No, it's totally fine. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how do how do you keep your team motivated on those projects? Because I mean, I know for a lot of our our work, I mean, we just try to pay people very well, and that's mm. that's a big part of how we motivate. Like, yeah. In just senior awesome talent is just we're just a, a steady and and probably above market paycheck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what's what's your what's your how do you motivate open source folks? I mean, it, it's I don't have to really do anything to motivate them. Like the people, and, and like I almost wouldn't want to. Yeah, yeah. The I mean, the, the people, the, the there there are four main devs on the team, and like all of them are just so like just gung ho and excited about working on it, and like and I in fact tell them pretty frequently sometimes like. Only do this if it's still fun and you want to be spending all this time. Like, I kind of almost feel bad that they spend so much time. How long have they been on for? Um, The oldest two have been on for maybe six to eight months. And then the other two are a little bit more recent. Um, Like, maybe within four or five months or so. Nice. Um, And they, like... It's 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 just like a, constant. It's I have a so few cool. side projects like that where people are just working out of fun for them. But yeah, yeah. It's... At least it's always been challenging for for me and my own personal life to motivate people for sustained periods on projects like that. Yeah, I, I think I think it's honestly I think the reason is that these people in particular are like really like they happen to be very excited about the project. They feel like and I, I shouldn't speak for them because I don't know. I really should ask them next time I have a call yeah, with them. Yeah, for sure. Um, like they it's a pretty new project and they have a lot of influence on the decisions made because like they're all way smarter than I am and they know a lot more than I do and they give me like that exactly like those are the kind of people you want to work with so I think part of it is that they have a good amount of influence um but also like I have I have I reach a fair amount of people with the YouTube videos so I'm bound to find some people that are really passionate about the thing and are super gung-ho because I'm reaching out to a lot so I don't, I don't do anything. They're just genuinely excited, wonderful, intelligent people. And they like 
really want to work on it a lot. Like there's one guy who's redesigning the entire motherboard for the pick and place. And he's, That's he's, a big he's job. it's a big job and he's a smart dude. And he like challenges me on stuff that I'm wrong about. Yeah. And like, that's what you want. But exactly. It's so cool. He's a sweetheart. He's just a great person. Oh, they're all wonderful. So I, I, I don't know. They're just, I, I, I guess motivation is not even a thing I really think about. It almost feels, I almost feel bad that they're spending so much of their own time working on it, but they seem to be having fun. So, you know, it's yeah. great. <laughs> it works that's, out. That's cool. Yeah. 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 But you know, and that's, that's kind of what's cool about it too, is like, I've also gotten to know them pretty well and become friends with them. And yeah, of course. you know, that's the thing I found about open source too. And like weirdly on Twitter, there's so much open source, like people that communicate on Twitter that seems to be quite a hub for that. Yeah. And seeing the communication of people there and like how interconnected they get and like the, the tight knit friendships that form from like the open source software maintainer community on Twitter is That's like, it's wild. It's so cool. So, so I, I actually don't have a huge social media presence, Okay. but, or, or Twitter or like an open source presence, but I feel like I, I have a similar dynamic with the people I work with. Yeah. Because, like, even people, you know, that, that we pay money to to work on product, I mean, they're not just, like, they put in crazy hours, like, because we pay them well. Like, if we've had people at SKA put in, like, 65-hour weeks while working full-time on another thing. Holy smokes. Yeah. Dude. And so those people were being compensated very well in order to do <laughs> that because they're pushing the limits of human endurance. <laughs> yeah. The one person I'm thinking of in particular that put in 65-hour weeks while working full-time somewhere else... Um, has been with us for like five years, right? And yeah. So, um, and actually brought in like some of our first big work, the referrals, you know? Yes. Yeah. You know, they, they like SK and they want to see it succeed. And right. So it's really similar to what you, and, and I mean, I have dinner with these people, we go out for drinks, yeah. you know, like yeah. we're friends, you know, like, right. so like not every, I'm not friends with every single person I work with, but like most of them, I would argue yep. like, and I, I like it better when it's that way. Exactly. Like and so, I, there was a place I used to work and the CEO of the company said like, uh, you know, we're not family, we're coworkers. And I was like, oh man, that sucks. Why can't you be both? And maybe not an necessarily. I where that might have been, but family. I don't want to go down No, it's way. not. It's not. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. It's, it's uh, not a place you know. Okay. Um, but like, it just, it was like, why can't it be both? Why can't it be both? Why can't, and maybe even not family, but just like, why can't you be close and care about the people that you work with? It makes it better. I agree. You know? I agree. Yeah. But I so think that's just being a decent person to work with. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's open source. Just not being an asshole. I think that, yeah, that's just being a good human. Yeah. You know? like, I think so, you yeah. know? And, like, just understanding how to interact with people properly, uh, you yeah. know, it goes a long way. When well, you'd be amazed. It doesn't, I don't think it has political lines. I don't think it has, like, you know, like, racial or religious lines. I don't think it has, like, even, I mean, maybe philosophical a little bit in the philosophy of not treating people badly. Sure. But like, I think anybody that's just a, has a good heart and, and is, you know, somewhat sociable. And even, I've had a lot of people that consider themselves extroverts say that I'm like one of the few people they hang out with. I'm, I'm or introverts, I should say. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert. But like, <laughs> and so are you, most likely. And so, if I had to venture a guess. <laughs> fair, you know, so, fair guess. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, I don't know. I think when you're good to people, like they tend to be good to you, right? I mean, it's not always true. Some people will spit in your sure. face and yeah. I mean, you, you might get this. I, I find I, I have kind of a polarizing personality, so I'm pretty unapologetically me. And I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that is, the wrong way. that's, but that is such a, a wonderful thing though, is like one of the traits I find the most like endearing and wonderful in people is genuineness. Like Thank some you. of the people yeah, that I'm closest with likewise. in my life is like, just like being exactly what you want to be and not changing who you are to facilitate the situation. <laughs> you just do what you want to do and not in a way that's like, fuck you, I'm going to, you know, go do whatever, you know, like it's more of like a, I'm genuine. But I think that's and how me. that manifests when you're a teenager and you haven't yeah. really grown into it yet. That yeah. That's true. Yeah. And then, but yeah. once you learn kind of like how to be a civil human being and Correct. like, you know, you know, <laughs> figure out how to be an adult that manifests as a, that manifests as just being genuine. And like, yeah, of course it's going to rub some people the wrong way, but whatever that they're not for me. You know, yeah, I same. love that. I'm I not love for that. them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like, cool. We won't be friends. I understand. I'm not for everybody moving on. Yeah. I love that. I think that's such that's a great wonderful. way to be. Well, and I feel like there's also some people where like, I get surprised sometimes. So I've had, I've had this happen too, where like I, I meet somebody on paper. So like this happened with my first college roommate Yeah, is him and I, we got, we, we 
we're, we're both like building circuit boards since we were kids. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> doing like perf board work and all sorts of, and like we were like, we lived in similar areas and we both had similar interests. And before we even started going to the same school, we both decided over the phone that we were going to start a company that made smart locks for the doors. And this would have been in like 2008, like before <laughs> smart locks were like really big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like we, we developed a smart lock prototype and, and we physically bolted it to the door. <laughs> it didn't have like any kind of mounting system that was good back then. That's great. And um, like the machine shop on the campus made some part that made it to a servo. And yeah. Drove the whole thing. And I remember, um, this is actually kind of funny. So what happened was, um, it had <laughs> the lock on the door at <laughs> this point that you could get it to. If you turned it a certain amount, you couldn't get it back open. It was like right between like locked and unlocked. And somehow we found that sweet spot where both of us were outside of the room. Oh no! And the mechanism locked in a way that the key wouldn't open the door back up. How did you have to go to your RA and be like, we did some stuff to our door and we can't get back in? Like That was basically, we had to call, we, I think we called the campus cops. And we're like, uh, I locked myself out. We were very vague. <laughs> <laughs> Did they have to like take the freaking door off on hinges? Ma- or? Sorry, the maintenance guy came in with a channel lock pliers and he tested <laughs> the entire locking mechanism out with like, yeah, right? And like, and, like 12 inches of lever arm. <laughs> and, and it's actually kind of like a little bit scary that that's all it takes. <laughs> to open one of those things? Yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that is a little terrifying. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think so much security is... Uh, just the perception of it keeps honest people honest. Exactly. It's a uh, um, oh, what's the phrase for that? It's like um, security through obscurity, or it's not security. quite that, but it's, it's like uh, it, it's a phrase like it's exactly that. The like the it's just making it more difficult. If you have a chainsaw, you can cut through a door, but of like course. who's gonna or freaking pry bar, bring a chainsaw? Or to jackhammer. The, exactly. Like you can do it. It's just yeah. how practical is it to do that? Yeah. I, I had to make a hell of a lot of noise. I mean, <laughs> yeah. for sure. not practical. Yeah, I, crowbar would be. I mean, if you could get it in, there's that's security true. cameras. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are ways, or like little like reciprocating saw, or like some, yeah, something lock pick. Lock pick. Yep. Yeah. That's probably the most low key way to do it. I also got in big trouble in college for something that I put on my door because nice. I had what a I had a um, RFID chip in my hand in college. Nice. Wait, you removed it since then? I got it out. How much did that hurt? A lot. Gee, I, I didn't have any antiseptic and the dude just like came at, I went to like a very professional like scarification piercist like guy like he's like receives awards in Germany every year for his nice. work. he's like really good this was in Germany you had it removed no it wasn't it wasn't yeah. it was in redacted because he's very spooky about the fact that he Got did it. this yeah okay um and he just like for 15 minutes went at it with like a, a blade. <laughs> yeah. <it. laughs> Usually I have to pay an editor to do that. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll redact ahead of time for you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was, I almost passed out. It was like 15 full minutes of him just like cutting and like trying to get this thing in there and like pull it out with these tweet. That's crazy. It was not good, but I'm getting a new one soon. <laughs> Why did you take it out if you're getting a new one? It's a very, well, uh, Long story short, like all I, good. I wanted. To, what was that? I said. I said all good. Okay. You got to truncate something. Yeah. yeah. He like it, it. Just it's not the protocol and frequency that I wanted. That makes sense. Yeah. And and I, when I got it in, I was like, I understood what I was doing, but I just didn't understand all the applications that the other ones could be used for. Yeah. So well, technology is constantly evolving. It is. I mean, the, the frequency that I got is an indru- industrial, it's 125 kilohertz, and okay. it's an industrial frequency that will be around before I, or it will still be around when I die. It's really cool. a good standard, but the newer one is more well-formed, and it's in your phone. So you can actually program it with your phone. Oh, cool. You can read it from your phone. Um, when I went to get mine out, my boss at the time, actually, we got, I, we went up together, and he got one in. Oh, and interesting. He programmed it with the Rickrolled URL, so he can scan it on his phone, and it goes, and it starts awesome. playing the song. <laughs> and then he put his like business card or whatever on it. But like, that's cool. Um, but in college, I had one of these, and I had a little reader on my door, and it was before winter break, and I said to my RA, "I just want to let you know, there's this. It has a little screen and like a reader that says like it was like Haas Dynamics or whatever the heck I put on it, you know, like RFID reader. I was like, I just want you to know, this is so I can unlock my door." I don't want you to freak out about this when you do my room inspection over winter break. I just want you to know. She's like, okay, thanks for telling me, Steve, and whatever. I go home for winter break. It's the day before Christmas. 
and I get a call from the chief of police oh. of Storrs, Connecticut, oh, around gosh. Yukon, yeah. and he's like, yeah, Stephen, I'm here with the, the uh, bomb squad and Wait, the fire marshal. Uh, we have some questions about your dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> so my RA thought it was a bomb. Oh, jeez. And she After calls, you told her? I told, I told her. And bomb squad comes in. They then they went to my room and they found a gasoline uh, engine, a flamethrower, and a whole bunch of propane tanks. And <laughs> I got in wait, a wait, wait, lot of trouble. <laughs> bomb squad came in and then they found them. <laughs> yeah, oh, they, they came because they thought the reader on the door was like a door activated bomb trigger thing. Why would you make it that obvious? I don't know. Like yeah, like if you were actually. And malicious. I told her like that's what I don't get. Yeah. But then they went in and then they're like, well, what else does this kid have? And they found a lot. I, of I don't understand stuff. people that become RAs. Like I feel like. <laughs> I like, think why do they choose to do it? Well, I, I think, I'll, I don't know. My experience when I was in college is that, like, I shouldn't say it, because there's going to be a lot of, like, nice people that are RAs that are probably going to be upset by this, you know, assuming this gets the viewership, I hope it gets. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I guess, I guess what it comes down to is, like, I mean, it just strikes me as, like, a snitch, like, somebody that likes getting people in trouble. Yeah, I, I think a, a, the reason that a lot of people will do it is because they get a discount on housing. And, they, and I'm, I have nothing wrong with yeah, people that do it. Yeah, yeah. And I've had some friends that are RAs that do it for that reason, yeah. that are just totally normal, friendly, yep. nice, down-to-earth you know, people. And yeah. I, but I think some people do it just because they like having power over other people. I, I think that might be the case here and there. Yeah. This, this RA that reported it was, like, very sweet and hands-off. I think she just, like, forgot and got freaked out when she saw, like, a glowing thing on my door. And she was like... Oh my god, what the heck is this thing? Instead of calling you, she called the police. <laughs> she called the she called the police and then they called the bomb squad and then yeah. they called the fire Yeah. It was not great. A lot of yeah. trouble on that one. And they were all huddled around it even though they thought it was a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like, I'm sure they looked at it and they're like, okay, this is fine. But, but this seems interesting. Let's see what's here. Exactly. Like, and this is not the, the first time. I almost got kicked off a cruise ship for rewiring a lamp to charge <laughs> my phone when I was, uh, it was right before my freshman year. How do you get kicked off a cruise? Do they just throw you overboard? <laughs> I almost got kicked out in Honduras. Are you serious? Yeah, 100%. They just yeah. leave you in whatever country they're they, at? They, they were like this close from doing that. They were really not, uh, it was really dumb, honestly. When you How go on a cruise you rewire ship. rewire it? Like, it was, okay, here's the deal. So, we got on the cruise ship, it was me, my brother, and my mom, and it, and you're only allowed one electrical outlet. You can't bring a power strip because they have power restrictions oh, for the boat. So you can only plug in, like, two things at a time. There were three of us, we all had phones. So I'm I'm sleeping on, like, the little pull-out couch, and there's a lamp sconce on the wall. Yeah. And I noticed that the front panel of the sconce is loose, so I pull it off, and I see that there's just, like, two, like, terminals on a switch and <laughs> easy I, enough to twist around the terminals on your phone i, I disconnect them and i tap and i'm like oh yeah that's 110 ac right there so i asked my brother for a piece <laughs> you of a meter did you just give it a quick short i gave it a quick i didn't have a meter on yeah. me i just gave it a Not quick the, tap uh, the, th the the fingers thing the old school electricians do what do they do the, the guys back in the old days they would shock their knuckles because your fingers will clamp because your muscles around a live circuit and then you'll that's where you're in trouble because you, you latch on. Yeah. But if it's just your knuckles, you don't have that muscle response. And so you get shocked quickly and no. You don't do that anymore. But like the, like the old guys back in the day. Yeah, we do, do the knuckle yeah, trick. Yeah, the knuckle trick. That's a good tip. I'm yeah. going to use that now. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, uh, don't do this at home. <laughs> this is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have to touch a live wire, that's the way to do it. Yeah, don't do it with an open hand if you're going to do it, obviously. I mean, but don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer in the description. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I asked my brother for a stick of gum, and it was the kind that had the foil lining. On it. <laughs> so I rip it in half, I chew the gum, and I use uh, a quarter of the gum to attach it to the two leads, and then the other quarter <laughs> to attach it to my phone, and sure enough, my phone starts yeah, charging. Yeah, that's like a very proud moment when you can get a rig something like that. Oh, uh, I was, I was excited. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was 17, 18, or nice. something, and and then I was a dummy, and I went to dinner. And left it unattended, which is the dumbest thing I could have possibly done. Not only because, oh my god, how dangerous is that? Of but course, it's a huge fire hazard. It's huge? I mean, there's literally paper on the other side of the foil, and like, it's connected with gum. Yep. Like, bad idea, Haas. But then the other thing is, they turn down your room on a cruise ship oh, they do during that? dinner. I didn't know that. So we're walking- What, are you in a prison? Like, why would you ever do that voluntarily? <laughs> 
I'm it sorry, was, cruisers are not. No, no, no funny. I'm sorry. Not uh, not turn down like like uproot everything, but they go like oh, make your bed and oh, leave a chocolate okay. on your pillow. Never mind. I thought it was like a surge. <laughs> yeah, they like raid your room. Yeah, I just figured, well, if they're that stringent about power, you know, I figure they had some kind of enforcement. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and we were walking down the hallway, and like I'm watching the numbers of the rooms count down. And I'm like, oh, this huge crowd in the hallway is about to line up with where our room is. <laughs> and thus ensued, like, a three-hour lecture from, like, the chief of security on the ship, and they, like, threatened us to kick us off well, at the I'm next sure stop. I'm sure all sorts of things about electrical engineering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much. But they did see that I had an electrical engineering book that I brought with me, and they're like, oh, this kid's probably just, like, like an engineer or something. But I had to sign all this paperwork, and, like, it was a what whole thing. What did they make thing. you sign? Um, uh, pretty much, I mean, like, long story short, None of it's was, valid anymore. I mean, it's... I mean, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't sure. really remember. Yeah. It was like, I promised to be on my best behavior. Oh, gee. That, that's toothless. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. like... It's I, psychological. I, they wanted you to... Yeah. They wanted me to feel like I was in you. trouble, and I did. Yeah. You know? And I kept seeing that chief of security around the ship, and I was just like, meekly waving at her the whole time, but... Yeah. yeah. You should have just made friends with her. Like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Good to see you again. <laughs> remember me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Charging my phone the right way now. Yeah, thanks to you. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get a power strip? Yeah. <laughs> My favorite part is as they're gum. leaving after. Yeah, you got any gum? I could really use it. Only if it has the foil kind, you know? Yeah. As they were leaving, my you mom. Just, just keep the gum, I'll just take the foil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just hand her the gum. Thanks, I just needed this. <laughs> My phone's a little low. <laughs> She's like, oh god. How about a soldering iron? You got a soldering iron? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> How do you disable the smoke detectors in the room? <laughs> Yeah, I, and as they were leaving, my mom had the gall to be like, uh, the, the remote for the TV doesn't work. Can you bring us another remote? Like, after three hours of lecturing, it was a whole did, thing. Did they bring it? They did. Nice. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I it mean, was, you're paying them a ton of money to be there. I like. guess so, but I almost burned down their ship. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> we would have burned down the whole ship. It would have probably been <laughs> contained somewhat, but... I hope so. I, think, uh, I mean, I guess you're at sea. It could be pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it could I've had be friends bad. in the Navy that have told me some horrible stories. But About bur boats burning? I, I don't know if, like, to the ground... I mean, they're pretty good at containing those fires because, I mean, they're, they train for it, you know? And there's Yeah. But, like, I've, I've heard stories about, like, you know, like a helicopter, like, on a tether in, like, a mid-Atlantic storm just swinging around making holes in the boat. Oh, my you know, gosh. Cra wow. Crazy. And then, like, just, you know, like, somebody going out and, like, like risking their life to cut the cord to send that helicopter into the ocean. Holy smokes. To save the boat. Like crazy right. stuff like that. I wow. Mean, I, you know, I've never served in the military, but I, that was another thing where when I was a kid, I was very idealistic and I was, I was like a huge pacifist and mm. I, probably to some extent still am, but mm. you know, I, I didn't have a whole lot of respect for veterans for that reason. Now I have so many friends that are veterans where I'm like, at least, I mean, I don't like everybody, but like I, I judge people on an individual basis. And yeah. I mean, the things those people do, like, I mean, it's, I have a lot of respect for it. Like yeah. it, it, it takes courage and, you know, like, uh, yeah. you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, when you, when you do what you say you're going to do. Um, oh, uh, integrity? Integrity. Yeah. 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 I mean, like yeah, yeah. just a whole lot of, you know, just spirit. I mean, like, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Like no matter no matter what, they're still putting themselves in situations where... Absolutely. They like, are even like, if you don't believe with, like, the war in the war that they're in, I mean, yeah. the fact that they're doing the things they're doing to help Inherently, the people they're fighting with, I mean, yeah. you got to have some respect for that person. Uh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I totally hear that. Yeah, yeah it's crazy. I, I, I bet they probably did have a lot of things in place to be able to facilitate... Yeah. The entire boat not going down. They probably, sure. like, a lot of things. Like, yeah. I would think they probably had, like, like an Ansel system yeah. and, had, like, a fire department. The walls and... probably are all, like, super enclosed and encapsulated so, like, the fire never gets past that one room yeah. or, like... Excuse me. I'm sure they have their methods. I mean, there was know. this great ship called the Titanic. They had this awesome watertight <laughs> doors. Yeah, like, I heard it worked perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Not, it's unsinkable. <laughs> yeah. uh... Clearly, these things just work out really well. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just very grateful I didn't burn down that boat. Yeah, and no, I'm glad you didn't burn down that boat either. Yeah, yeah. That I'm was... also glad you get to stay on it. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I guess I'm not into cruises. It feels a little too... Uh... I really am not either. But like... it's your parent. I mean, you're on a family vacation. Yeah, so I... It's I, I... their taste. It's not your... Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't choose to go on one. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I brought that electrical engineering book to, like, give me something to do the whole time. Because I was just, like, I was up on the deck bored. And I was like, yeah. I'm just going to read my book about, you know... How does a transistor work? And yeah, no, I would do the same as a kid. I, yeah. When did you get into it? Like, how old were you when you first started messing with electronics? And with electronics? Well, so like, 
when I was probably like a sophomore in high school, I was like, electronics are a thing. And like my grandpa gave me his old soldering iron. I'm gonna try and make like a stomp box distortion pedal for my guitar. That's awesome. And I like found a schematic online and just blindly bought all the parts like from Radio Shack in person because I didn't I miss know that Radio Shack. DigiKey was like a thing. We just recorded another episode, which I don't know what the order they're gonna come out. I probably shouldn't have said that, but <laughs> um, at some point we may record an episode <laughs> where we talk about how awesome Radio Shack was. Yeah, but, like, yeah. Did you did you hit do you hit it when they were closing? Like Oh no, dude, I hit it when they were closing, but I hit it in the middle of a hackathon. And oh. we needed stuff for the hackathon. Oh. We needed like all these op amps for like a it was a headset that would detect sound and like notify a deaf wearer of where the sound came That's from awesome. with like vibration. I love stuff like that. It was cool as heck. It was a really fun project. And it was like we needed stuff last minute. And we went to a Radio Shack and they were going out of business and they were like just giving stuff away. Yeah. I bought like all this EL wire and like I bought all their whole like IC like <laughs> stock. It was great. I went after relays and switches because they have the lowest markup. Oh they really? Were 90 cents on the dollar. It was 90% off or 10 cents on the dollar. It was 90% off. Wow. That's wild. Yeah. Wow. And th that's applicable anywhere. Like those are just good to have them. Yeah, I still have like I, I have like Santa Claus bags full of Radio Shack yeah. stuff. That yeah, I so th th I spent like 400 bucks. Which meant I spent four thousand bucks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you bought like like a quarter of their stock. <laughs> Pretty much, I cleaned out like all the relays and switches. I hit five locations. Like we. Oh, we, you went on a tour. We made a day of it. Like it was like me and like my one friend who was like the father of my other friend. Yeah. And so he's like he's like a like a sixty something year old dude. He just retired. He's a super cool guy. Like yeah. He had a uh, engineering consulting company as well. And, yeah. Um, he, he he like works on like like super accurate clocks as a hobby like like oh, for cool. like a millisecond or like I think digital, goes, uh, digital. But okay. I think he goes like it might be I might be getting it wrong. It might be like an order of mag a few orders of magnitude better than millisecond accuracy. Wow! But he uses like GPS antennas to calibrate them, and then he has like <laughs> he's got like a um, a clock with a pendulum that he like has installed an electromagnet into to calibrate the pendulum. GPS time. <laughs> what? So, you got to introduce me to this guy. Yeah, absolutely. He sounds cool uh, as heck. Dude. Remind me at some point after we'll the pod. We'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll make the call. Uh, cool. Yeah. Cool. Written down. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow, that's so sweet. So you just cleaned house. Yeah, yeah, we cleaned up, and uh, it was fun. I met another guy while I was doing it who was uh, also like a like an older gentleman, like um, and he uh, I'd say old, like he was probably in his early sixties. Okay. And he was like just retired, but he worked on like like gambling machines for bars. Oh, okay. I'm pretty sure it was illegal. Like he had like a workshop <laughs> in in the attic of a beer distributor. <laughs> and, and That's pretty cool. It though. was pretty neat. The yeah. guy and the guy had like all this stock. He was just selling me. Like I got like a like a dollar bill sensor that I just put on eBay because I was and it was broke and it turned out. But he gave it to me for five bucks. They were like the value was like you know like eighty bucks from like eBay or whatever. So I mean, wow. I'm not complaining. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And he gave me like a bunch of like arcade stuff because he would work on like arcade machines, wow. and gambling machines. Yeah, and yeah. That was like how he earned all his money, and it was like it was an interesting. And he was like, just I think for him to see like like a younger guy that was also interested in making stuff and was yeah. buying all the stuff I was buying. Yeah. He's like, you want to buy more stuff? Yeah, you know? right, right. Like, help, let me help the next generation like go and off. Also and also unload all this crap that I can't do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kill two birds. Yeah, exactly. I had a uh, the Bay Area Maker Fair one year. I talked to a guy extensively oh, cool. about the um, how pinball machines work, and the one thing that I took away from Is it that was Santa Clara. I feel like. Uh, San Mateo. San Mateo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Rest in peace, no longer happening. Yeah, yeah. I was I got invited to the last one and I, I kind of skipped it. Oh really? I just I don't know. I'm not that into maker affairs. I used to be. I just uh, yeah, I just kind of lost the. I, well, I was on a business trip. I didn't really have a whole lot of time. And yeah, so I, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I it's cool that you were there. I we might have bumped into each other in a different. I'm way I'm sure at, at yeah. one uh, at one maker fair, there's a photo that I took or that my boss took when I uh, was working at Form Labs that has yeah. me in it and another one of my coworkers in it. And he, we, none, of, none of the three of us had met. Holy but crap. he just took a picture at Maker Faire and we could find ourselves in that picture. It was crazy. Yeah, when I've seen, like, I was at one in, in uh, it was I think it was in Queens in New York City. Yeah, yeah, oh, that, that was the one that we, yeah. that we took that picture at, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, there were, like, yeah, MakerBot had, like, a booth there and they had that cupcake CNC that was a real piece of crap back in the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they were making fun of it, like because they were like, "Oh, we're, we're so sorry, we released that product." Like they were, like, <laughs> and so like it was it was really funny. They like like the sales rep for MakerBot was like like apologizing for the existence for of the, the older printer. Yeah, and a bit at the Cunningham Miller Box Club, you know, we had a bond of those, which is what I brought up, and that's how her and I started talking. Yeah, 
And so she's like, oh, I'm so sorry you had to deal with that thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was cool. It had a conveyor belt on it. Yeah. Like, Wait, it, it automatically... Yeah, the, the, the old cupcakes would automatically eject the print when they were done, and it could just print that's continuously. Awesome. Yeah. But I think that the reason they... That would have been really ahead of its time, then, because that's... The reason they scrapped it is, I'm pretty sure, because of patent infringement. Ooh. Because recently... I'm really excited about this. The company Creality makes uh, FDM 3D printers, yeah. and SLA now. Cool. Um, they recently released a printer called a CR30, which is a belt printer. Yeah, I've heard about this. It's... I you, can't. No, you and I were talking about. This. We probably were because I won't shut up about this thing. It's so cool and do like. They use silicone for the bed because I feel like that would be the way to do it. I don't know what the the bed is made Think of. About like fiber reinforced silicone conveyor belt because it's smooth. You can print on it. And when yeah. you Get to the edge. It'll just. I, I, I'm just thinking of this now. Yeah. This yeah. Is, this is kind of like a spitball, but. Yeah. I don't know what they use. It, it, it's very textured. It almost looks like. I, I don't even know. It, it looks like grip tape or like, a, it, it looks like a treadmill, honestly. Yeah, that's cool. It, it's weird as heck. But it's but also high temp with silicone too, so you could heat it. And... That's true. I don't know if, I think the bed is heated. I don't know. I don't know if their bed is heated on it, but yeah. they just, they did a Kickstarter and like they're an established company. I'm not sure why they did the Kickstarter, but. It makes sense. They did and like. It doesn't make sense, but I see what you're going for there. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, and like. The fact that, but yeah, anyway, the, the whole point here is that they're not infringing the patent. I think this is the case because it's not a, a Cartesian printer. The X, Y axis is at 45 degrees. Wait, what? So that way, what you can do is the belt moves along like this and yeah. then X and Y, the head moves like that. Interesting. So you'll print one layer and it's really just a line. The next one's right. a kind of a square. It's a bigger square. And then you start printing these full things. Yeah. But because it's at that, de that 45 degree, you can print infinitely long. Because it will just print over and over and over. So people oh, are so the Z axis is the belt. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah, but but also slicing for it and like trying to support overhangs. Like a, a straight up and down wall is effectively a 45 degree overhang, but only if it's on the leading edge. They would have to texture that, I feel like, to get the kind of grip to, to get that to, because they're fighting, they don't have gravity on their side. The way they they don't. Like and that. like like a Benchy is like the classic FDM calibration print. There's no orientation in which it prints well. Yeah. You just can't print it well because it's just a totally different Benchies, paradigm. Benchy's like the boat that you see? It's the little crappy little boat thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Knows, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. It's, it's just fascinating to me. But like they can eject it. And because it's not Cartesian, I think that's their argument for why it's not infringing on the conveyor belt patent. That's interesting. Um, but it's up in, I think, relatively soon. I should really look this, look this up. Um, yeah. But really, really cool. The, the idea that you can, and it has a mode where you can say, I want 50 of these parts. And it will like print one, eject it off the belt, print another, eject it off the belt, That's and you so put cool. a bin in front of it, and you go to sleep, and you wake up, and it's not like your parts done. It's like your whole production run of parts are done. That's awesome. I want one so badly. I want one yeah. so bad. Yeah, you should get a bunch of them. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the Kickstarter, but I'm like trying to pull the trigger on buying one like as soon as possible. What are they? Do you know what they're trying to price for that roughly? Yeah, it's like uh, the Kickstarter price was like 500. Um, Ooh, that's incredibly low. It's really good. And then the how do they um, do that? Like, a... I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, Creality understands how to put together like an aluminum extrusion 3D printer. They have a, their um, the Ender three. I bought one of these recently. I've heard good things about that. Hundred and eighty dollars. What what? It's a hundred and eighty bucks, and it prints a dream. Like it's it prints so That's well. incredible. Yeah. Out of the box, dude. It's so good. That's awesome. So they know how to do it. I've heard good things. Yeah. Afterwards, after the Kickstarter, the price is going to be around a grand. Yeah. Um, but it's still excellent. I mean, whatever for that, like it's. That's that's peanuts. It's exactly like it's it's so worth it for what it's going to enable you to do. It's so cool. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I really like the idea of being able to like automate that kind of stuff very easily. Like if you need to like make and this is kind of like the idea of the pick and place. Like if you need to make five of something, you can hand solder them. If you need to make five of something, you can just print them on your printer and remove them and clean them up and whatever. But if you want to make a million of something, you use injection molding for plastic parts. If you want to make a million of something, you use an expensive pick and place. Yeah, well, typically, like the, I don't know, what is it, like the thousand quantity is where injection molding seems to start to make economic sense. Yeah, around around that is kind of what I've seen, yeah. especially if you... I mean, it depends are, on the part, obviously. I'm just kind of... Yeah, and like thinking. aluminum molds. Like, if you yeah. do aluminum instead of steel, it makes it a lot cheaper, too. Yeah. And like who you're going through and all that stuff. And then hardened steel versus, like, it right. depends how you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in the middle, like, if you need to make, like... 500 of something a year like a thousand or something a year you're not going to hand solder those and it's expensive to go to a, a place to produce them yeah well i have clients that 3d print stuff you know who um 
I mean, they, they still 3D print at higher quantities because for them it makes more sense. Exactly. And like, yeah. but, but something like the Sierra 30 makes it a lot easier. Like, sure, you can buy a bunch of printers and like have someone sitting there 24 7 removing parts and like starting like an again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or you can just. The guy we know. <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? <laughs> yeah. Or, or you can just set this machine up to just do it. It's so freaking cool. I want it so badly, dude. They're so sick. They're so sick. It does sound like fun, I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah. And especially because it's so inexpensive to play around with it. Like, at first they had some weird firmware problems and, like, they were trying to adapt Marlin to, like, print at 45 degrees, weirdly. Yeah. But they're tuning it up. I mean, that's math for sure. <laughs> yeah. Definitely some math involved Love in that. linear algebra going on there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it is cool. It's cool now that the cost of all this stuff has come down a lot. It's interesting to see what people are like. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, I agree. I mean... The fact that they can hit a buck eighty for the, um, you know, the other thing, Brothers Cherries, by the way, they're really good. I oh yeah, really like them. yeah, yeah. They're they're the best maraschino cherries I've ever had. Mm. Right? Chef's kiss. I'm glad you like them. They're very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it is crazy how cheap it can be. Yeah, that's insane. Anyone can buy like a little soldering kit, and a printer, and just like start futzing around with it. Yeah. So quickly. That is one thing that, like, I mean, back in my day, you know, they, didn't, they didn't have three <laughs> printers. <you know? laughs> but I did have a size. So I started soldering when I was like seven years old, right? Oh, wow. So, yeah. How'd you get introduced to soldering as like a thing? So the way I got introduced to like electrical stuff. So I started with the alligator clips from Radio Shack. And what it was is um, I had a friend whose father was an audio engineer who recorded like Biggie Smalls and Smashing Pumpkins. No yeah. way. Wow. And and in his attic and then in the... In the mid to late 90s because mm -hmm. I was born in 88 right? okay so uh, it would have been like around 95 like Tupac was still alive when I first started messing with electronics well I, I was yeah. born in 95 yeah okay yeah that makes oh, sense yeah, you were okay. seven yeah exactly yeah. okay so I was, I was seven years old yeah mm -hmm. and so I think he, he was murdered in 96 but anyway, I want to make this about Tupac <laughs> and just, God rest his soul a great guy big fan of Tupac but uh anyway um you know it's uh basically what happened was um I, um, I, it was a few things. So one was that the friend's dad, um, and in his attic he had, he was building a robot to take CDs off a CD burner. Though I think he had a stack of them, and um, he, he would put labels on them. So he had this company, uh, I don't know if they're still around or not, but it's called Digital Dynamics Audio Incorporated, okay. DDAI. And so they would, um, they would burn CDs, and he had mm -hmm. like these computers that were loaded up with like eight CD burners, and he would run them all at once. Oh, and then, wow. yeah, and then he would put labels and he would print them. And so to print them, he would, um, he paid this guy Juan like uh, a bunch of money uh, mm -hmm. in his mind to do a half ass job. And he's like, why should I pay him more to do a quarter ass job? <laughs> so it's like, that was Francisco's sense of humor. And so, you yeah. know, it's, and so basically what it was is um, he wanted to replace Juan with a robot. <laughs> oh <laughs> <So> boy. <laughs> automating the workplace. In the nineties. He, so he had this, he had this little robot there was a linear slide and then a solenoid and it would pop the CD onto the robot by popping down with the solenoid and uh -huh. then it would slide over to the printer, pop it onto the printer and then Grab a it label? would, um, well, it, it was a label printer. So the thing would, um, oh, would I see. slide the CD in as it printed. And so the, the jet was there. Oh, it printed directly onto, onto the, the CD. CD. Yeah, exactly. Get out of here, dude. Yeah, that's what it did. And so, was it just an inkjet printer that he just just modified an inkjet to printer? You no, know, it was it was made for that. Pur it was purpose built. He just couldn't oh. find a robot that would load it. And so, interesting. Okay, I see. He eventually ended up buying a robot to do the job that that existed. They made them eventually. Really. But before that, he had one that was, it was a linear slide, and then it was a solenoid. It went boop. Tss, 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 tss. This is in '95. Yeah. So he would take is it, it off like the using cut. like a PLC for this? Like, what do you have for controlling I a thing like this? I think it was custom. I believe he was doing it with like circuitry that he he perf boarded together and either wire wrapped or soldered. Like seventy four series logic gates kind of thing. Like I, I don't, I think so. Like stuff like that. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what he was using, but I, I think it was gate. I think it was TTL and gate logic. That's so cool. The guy was a badass. Like he, I mean, I think he's still alive. So the guy is a badass. I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But like he, uh, I haven't talked to him in a while. But he, um, wow, he taught me all about like uh, like relay logic and and yeah. you know resistors and Ohm's law. Yeah, and this was in kindergarten and, and through like you know like grade school. 
<laughs> I was still picking my nose in kindergarten. Yeah, dude. Well, was, I mean, this is why I'm actually kind of good at what I do. I have the level <laughs> yeah. of knowledge I do. Yeah. You know, like at my age, just because I started like way earlier than most people. I mean, it doesn't sure. totally count because it's not engineering. Ex- it's not industry experience. But, the but I mean, you're still getting your feet wet out of the gate so you can get yeah. into the industry faster. Well, this you is know? like you on that cruise ship, right? I mean, this is, <laughs> so this, this, so like one of the first things we made was an alarm system that would, um, it would <laughs> drop like a little ball on someone's head when they walked. And it was to fuck with Francisco. So me and his son, Alex, would put together this alarm and we had a solenoid on it. And then there was, we used connects to constrain this ball in place. <laughs> and the solenoid would pop the ball out. And then we had a beam and, um, like it was Alex's godfather, like made the beam circuitry, and it, yeah. it was also like like op amps and stuff, and like it's just all analog. That's wild. yeah. And so I I do have a soft spot for analog circuitry, although I mean professionally you just can't anymore unless yeah. it's like nuke. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know it's um, but anyway, it's it's pretty cool. Um, and wow. so yeah, that's what I was doing when I was like like you know not even you know ten years old yet. Wow. So, so how, how did you like like begin to conceptualize and understand how those logic gates and stuff were working together. Like, did he, he didn't have like data sheets printed out or anything, did he? We didn't look at data sheets, so we weren't that advanced, but it was kind of like you with the Radio Shack run. So we were just looking for stuff that was like, sort of could do it, and you would like blindly follow schematics. So I had this book okay. called The Encyclopedia of Electronic Circuit, where there were like no component values. And you would, it's, it's all just like theoretical. Half, yeah, it didn't work half the time. It was like it was like hand drawn. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and like um, you know, but you could go to like it, it was it was like this thing. I still have it on my bookshelf. Really? Home, but I, I don't. I'm not gonna follow stuff out of it for work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Want to keep my job? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, fair enough. <laughs> but but basically, what it is is you know it's it's, it's a lot of conceptual. You know, like. Like, these are circuits for your car. Here are circuits for your motorcycle. Right. Here are circuits that are alarms you can use. Yeah. I was really into security systems when I was a kid. Yeah. Because, like, my parents had this, like, motion sensor, and I would, like, Ocean's Eleven around. If you move slowly <laughs> enough with a PIR sensor, yeah. it doesn't detect you, I found out. Yeah. And so I, I had this game where I would, like, try to see if I could, like, break into or out of my parents' house with their ADT system. <laughs> and and I, I was pretty good at it. Like, I found a bunch of different ways. Like, there were, switch, there were doors with, like, tapper switches, and if you jammed a butter knife in the door and, like, just, it, it, it would, you'd get it in the door jam and it would constrain the switch. <laughs> And then you could just open the door. That's and then, great. You know, like, I, I would take, like, the magnetic switch that they put on the windows, because this is, yeah. I was a little older at this point, and they would use it so we couldn't sneak out, because I was, like, I was, like, 15 years old, we're starting to go to parties and drink a little bit and yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it, there was that fault, front window, and then, like, your parents would catch you, and you didn't get the party that night. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, so did you hold a magnet up to it to trick the reed switch into, like... <laughs> I, I removed, I took a screwdriver when my parents were at work, and I took the magnet off, and then I like taped it to the magnetic sensor so it's smooth. That's great. It would have been nicer to put a magnet on. It it I like that though. Yeah, I, just, I, I like that a lot. You just, just pull it off and tape it on there. Yeah, I just moved to the other side. I don't think I glued it. I don't think it would have been that mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But enough to do the job. It just enough to get me out there. And then I think I put it back the next day yep. after I'd gone to the party. You know, and so... That's um, brilliant. <laughs> we were, like, taking model rockets and filling them with fireworks at that age. Like, um, we made a locker alarm in sixth grade that we sold to the other sixth graders. Oh, what? Like, it was a alarm oh, locker for alarm. lockers. Oh, I see. We sold two units. It was a horrible failure. Uh, <laughs> oh, from, like, you sold a, something a in business like... perspective. Yeah, I guess. It was better than a lemonade stand. But, yeah, like, for sure. You know, I was, I was it, always entrepreneurial. Um, so we took an alarm from Radio Shack that oh. used it, and it was, like... That was our biggest uh, material expense. I think it was like a, like a twelve dollar alarm. Okay. And then we added a DB nine connector, so like the serial connector. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then <laughs> this is so rudiment. You could have defeated this thing so easily. We just bridged two of the pins together, and it was a different two pins for each one we sold. And completing the circuit disarmed it. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and then and then we installed the other DB nine connector in one of those Radio Shack enclosures. Yeah. And so I think we made like two dollars. We made like thirty dollars. We sold them for thirty five. Hey, that's two bucks you didn't have before. Yeah, it was five. It was like not a lot of money. Yeah. One one of them malfunctioned and, and some kid had it and I think he hit it with an axe. And he couldn't get <laughs> oh stuck my god. It. You want a refund? Here's Johnny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's freaking hilarious. Yeah, it was dude. pretty funny. And I then love it. Another one got vandalized while it was on someone's locker and like they thought it was a fire alarm and they <laughs> vacated the school. No, no, no. That, that was a different story. So <laughs> 
<laughs> they knew what it was. They knew it was like, oh, Spencer and Alex, you know, like yeah. their alarm, you know, went off. You yeah. Know? And it was, it was this other kid, Chuck, that was kind of a terrorist and would just, <laughs> met, like me and Alex figured out how to disable the security. This was the 90s. And so Apple computers didn't really have security ship. Okay. So there was this third party program called On Guard at the time. Okay. And it was an extension that loaded into Mac OS 9, which is what <laughs> we were using then. Yeah. And so to disable the extensions, you would typically hold the shift key as the computer was booting up. And anything that didn't ship with the computer wouldn't work. And so it was like their safe mode. Oh, wow. Okay. And so... Um, you know, on guard didn't ship with the computer. Yeah, so yeah. That's the first thing we tried, and it turned out that didn't work because one of the features of on guard is you can change the key to disable the extension. Well, so to this day, I remember that all we did was one of us looked over the the sysadmin's shoulder as he was doing it, and it was Apple Option Eight. <laughs> and so <laughs> when we figured that out. We told Chuck, who was like the biggest troublemaker in the school, <laughs> and he just started like going in and deleting files and putting like pornography, <laughs> doing all this messed up, you know, kind of funny in my opinion. Yeah. But like at the time, could have gotten us in what we perceived to be a lot of trouble stuff. You yeah, know? yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It was, it was, there was another one I got, uh, this is, these school stories are fun. But, yeah, like, yeah. So there's another one where like I, um, <laughs> I got in trouble in math class in fourth grade for not showing my work. Okay. So it was long division and, um, and they thought I was cheating and, and the teacher made me stay after. And, and I was like, he was like, um, I was like, look, if I can, if I can do this with you watching me, you know, and explain how I did it, can I just not have to show my work in this class? And he was like, yeah. And so I, I was doing long division in my head. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't do this anymore. I have a calculator now. Yeah, but right, like, right, right. Yeah. At the time, you know, I was, you know, I was just trying to, you know, exercise the brain. Wow. Because yeah, you're a kid. So. That's such a power move to just be like, yeah. you know what? I'm going to prove to you that <laughs> yeah. I'm not cheating. I'm just going to do it and you're going to see. Yeah. Did he let you know? Yeah, he allowed me to do it after that. That's awesome. Well, and then I had, I had another teacher where, like, I, this was sixth grade. And, and I learned how to program. My first language I ever learned to program was TI Basic, like text. Me text. too, dude. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah, 100%. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to sell programs for chemistry classes. Nice. I would, like, write them the night before a test. And I come in early, and as people would come in for this, be like, "You want the program?" I charge like new stuff? twenty bucks, you know, like and just like <laughs> way more money than the locker alarm. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You it beam would... it over with a little like. Yeah, they have like a little headphone jack that they oh, send dude, it over. Oh, we wrote an instant messaging app, so we could like te- like in the '90s before there was text messaging, we had a T83 Plus messenger, and then we wrote a program for our math teacher that would make seating charts randomly, but it would always seat me and Alex next to each other. And wait, so, what? Wait, wait, wait. This is a calculator that has messaging built in? Well, we wrote the messaging. So it was a T83+. Plus. How was it? Was it wireless? No, no, no. It was a link cable. You had to plug a cable into each one. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, it was, it was very obvious that we were, we had yeah. our calculators connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we were passing notes through them. <laughs> Digitally <laughs> passing notes. Yeah. That's so cool. It was ahead of its time. Nobody else was doing it back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, the other one we did that was, like, really unique for the day is we had, like, um, like home automation stuff. So we would, like, hook to the parallel port on the computer and, like, turn on and off lights and stuff. And <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know. How are you doing that with Windows? Like, are you with just like Windows, manipulating yeah. the port? Like, I would imagine in Linux, you could probably the just like. The port gives you a lot of access to like individual. Like, it's. I think it has. It's been a while, so I don't remember it intimately, but I think it has GPIO on it. Really? Yeah. Wow, I did not realize well, that. Nobody uses parallel ports anymore, why would you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Is it like. Like, was this in Windows that you were doing this? This was in Windows. I didn't use Linux back. I'm still not really a Linux guy. I mean, I, I respect it. Yeah. And I have a lot, I, I like it and I would want it on a robot that we ship. Yeah. I'm just not, I'm just not personally, I have too much muscle memory. On yeah. I recently switched over to Linux for my desktop nice. daily driver and, and like. My brother's really into it. It's, it's pretty good. Like there's a couple things about it that kind of suck, but like, honestly, I have the i3 window manager and I can, I can rearrange all four of my monitors in a heartbeat with like. Like just seven key trucks. presses. I just do it and everything's exactly That's where I so want cool. it. And then I have my Mac for mobile and like that works pretty good for me. And I can boot my computer into Windows 2. I have a That's pretty awesome. But Linux is pretty good. It's like pretty That's useful. Much of my brother is like pretty, like he's got pretty good work habits. I mean, he has like a healthcare IT software company. Yeah. And he, um, I mean, he runs Linux for his main thing. I yeah. mean, his wife's father was like on the original Linux dev team and was not like a Google guy. No way. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, aside from like, I don't know, like Zoom client sometimes doesn't work and I just do that on my Mac or like, (laughs) but like, you know. uh, I imagine CAD would be kind of a pain in the rear. Yeah, CAD. Well, I use FreeCAD. Okay, nice. Because I'm a masochist. (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's, 
it's not, honestly pretty good. I, I shouldn't I shouldn't poo poo it, but I all all of my CAD software runs on Linux. So that's like awesome. uh, KiCad and FreeCAD, and that's pretty much it. And then I just edit in like VS Code for my text editor and yeah. everything else, and that's it. So all my stuff works really well on Linux. So yeah, there's no reason I can't do it. But that makes sense. Except for video editing, that's the one thing that I can't do in Linux. Have so you I seen have to do it all. Adobe, not Adobe, sorry, um, the Black Magic product, DaVinci Resolve. Yes, I have. Yep, and I think it might actually run on Linux, but. It's, if I'm going to pick something, if I'm going to switch away from Final Cut Pro, because I've been using Final Cut Pro for like a decade. Oh, yeah. You're, and you're, you're good at it. I'm, I have a custom keyboard shortcut set up, and I like, I can edit really fast. That's why you would switch if you're, if you're editing at the volume you are. Yeah, if I'm going to edit, if I'm going to switch, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it something that is cross-platform so I can edit either at home on my desktop or on my Mac, yeah, and have it be open source in case I want to edit, or like change the way it operates, or like file a PR or whatever. But there's just nothing out there. Like Blender has video editing, and then there's like Shot Cut and like Caden Live. There's a bunch of them, but I haven't found one that I've been, I like. I've been kind of liking software lately, like where you know you can pay for it, but then you own it. Like I, I kind of prefer that over. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Do you do you use uh, video editing software or? So I, in making this podcast, I've been trying to learn. Um, I mean, I guess I messed around as a kid, but I was never good at it. Uh -huh. Uh, but I've been trying to learn for the pod, uh, just just to you know to kind of get good at something new and also to save money if we really want to put these out at volume. Yeah. And um, uh, I guess DaVinci Resolve just I like their business model. Right? Yeah. I'm a big fan of Black Magic. We have a bunch of their gear here in the studio. Yeah. Um, it's an Australian company. They make really high end gear. And, yeah. And I like that. And then just the fact that they'll they'll give you the free version just for free, and that does most of what you need. Yeah. Like there was a, there was an engineer um, that I, I respect a lot that recommended it to me that said, you can have a team of editors, you can have 10 people running the free version and two senior editors running the paid version. And it's, which I mean, makes you wonder how much those people are making an hour, but like, <laughs> but like the $300 software license is your bottleneck to having a team that large working on yeah. a project. But yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, hmm. I don't know, like. I don't want to name other brands and talk too much crap, but like, I mean, 300 bucks, then you have it forever. That doesn't seem too bad to me. Like, yeah. Yep. For the good version, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is pretty good. Like if it's going to be investment and Final Cut Pro, I think is the same way, um, where like you spent, it's like three or 500 bucks up front, but like, and it is kind of like iMovie with some bells and whistles, but yeah. like they're the bells and whistles you need. Like and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and yeah, it does the job for what I need. Like I, I do some weird masking and comping out sometimes. Yeah. And if I really need something, I go into After and if, Effects. If these people work their balls off to make the software, they should get to charge for it. Like, I don't know. I agree. Yep. Yeah. And, but like similarly, right? If somebody wants to open source something, they should get to put it out for free. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, exactly. It's like, it's, like, it's, it's the, yeah. your own onus of responsibility to decide how you want to charge for it. And like yeah. my, my only beef is when like, like Fusion 360 did this recently with their CAD thing where they were like, it's free. Look at all this free stuff. And they wait and they buy their time until everyone comes in like, Ooh. wow, this free thing. And then they're like, we're going to charge you. It's like, ah, uh, okay. So now I've invested all this time <laughs> in learning it that. and all my CADs in it. And like, That's just pretty sneaky. It is like, I appreciate being upfront about it. If you're like, I'm going to do X and MakerBot did the same thing. They're like, yeah. we're going to be open well, source. Well, and then they switched. Though, they got purchased. I don't think that was. They went closed source before they got purchased. Oh, actually? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> not a huge fan of that decision. Yeah. Um, Want some more water, by the way? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, sir. Awesome. But, you know, as, as long as, if they want to be closed source, I, that's totally fine. You know, like, you get to do that. It's your product. It's your work. Yeah, but when you, you do get all these people to build it for you and then you switch it over. And then you dip. It's like, ugh, yeah. you know, that's rough. Because that's, you know? that's violating those people's consent, I feel like. Uh, yeah. You and want like, some whiskey as well? Sure. I <laughs> this is like, it's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Much obliged. That's funny. Thank you. Um, you know, I, th I think the most important thing is just like being transparent and honest about your intentions of the thing. I agree. And I you think know? that's, I mean, that's part of the ethical capitalism thing I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, just be upfront about what you're trying to do, you know. Exactly. Yep. Don't screw people over. Yep. The, the point is to play the game because we have, we all have to play the game to put food on the table. Like yeah. try and play it in a way that doesn't destroy other people. If possible, I agree. You know, and also try not squeeze every any out of them that you possibly can. Well, like I mean, like you said, like you're not always going to have everybody pleased with you 100 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. just as a result, of your personality, yep, or a perceived affront, or just I don't know, like a religious or political difference. But yep. At the same time, you know, like I try to stay away from religion and politics because mm -hmm. it's just a wedge. Yep, know? yep, yep. And um, you know, and at least talking about it, obviously my own stuff. But sure. Like, 
you know, at the same, and also like, I just try to treat people well. You treat people the way you want to be treated. Yep. That, that's such an important thing to, to how I try to act and do business and, yep. and treat other folks. Yep. Yeah. I, I think that that's one of the biggest things is like coming to terms with the fact that you're not going to please everybody. Like one, one of the it's things hard, man. it's, it's hard. And like one of the things I've really enjoyed about having a YouTube channel is the hate mail <laughs> because there are some people who Spencer, they spend time thinking about too. the most mean, like digging things they can possibly say. And most of the time it's just like, whatever, you're salty. And then they type it wrong and they, yeah, it's like, okay, it. whatever. You, you know what you're talking about? Cause if someone's angry, they don't think straight. So yeah. They're just it, yeah. blasting it out. But some are gems. Like one of my favorite ones ever <laughs> is like, on me. um, I've never seen a more punchable face. <laughs> are you serious? I love it's it. Fucking hilarious. It's so good. I've never seen a more punchable face. And like, I get it. I can see watching one of those and be like, I would punch him. Like, I, I can, I'm on board, you know? That and then... Um, I've never seen a more punchable face. Yeah. Oh, oh your, your positivity is nauseating. I oh, like geez. that one too. Just a lot of people just like, he's annoying he's as hell. He's a nice like, guy though. I mean, like... I, you, but I'm a, I can be a lot. You are that dude. I, mean, I can like, be a lot. Like, I'm, I'm loud and boisterous and like enthusiastic and like a lot of people don't like that. And like, it that's does, fine. I can see how somebody might perceive it as inauthentic if they just saw you on YouTube and they didn't know you in real life. Yeah. I get that a lot. A lot of that, people are like, it's so fake. It's like, I'm not, like, I'm just that really annoying like in that. real life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, I'm not putting it on. Like, I'm just yeah. that annoying. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But it's been a great exercise. I have doing exactly that, that. I feel like I'm going to get that. Uh, for sure, right? I mean, we're starting a podcast. <laughs> yeah. by, by the time this episode airs, we'll have, we'll have. Uh, I mean, again, if have hate mail. To, yeah, we'll have hate mail. <laughs> yep. I thought we got it when we put the first episode out. Um, I, I thought we had some, and it turns out it was just Russian porn bots. Or, <laughs> oh yeah, I get it. those. It was, yeah, it was, it was really funny. They were like, I was like looking up the uh, the top level domains. Like I'm like, what's this slang? You know, and it, Urban Dictionary, of course, had it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't, what did I do? It forty two seconds in, and it was just it just went to pornography, and so. I reported it or deleted it. I probably should have just left it for the for the, for the, for the meme. Or, or for just seeing activity on the channel. <laughs> for engagement. Yeah, for engagement. Yeah, for yeah right. exactly. Oh, nice of you to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. YouTube algorithms like, oh, people, people are watching this. This yeah. is great. Thanks for the constructive criticism. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did type that to one of them before I realized it was pornography and clicked on it. <laughs> uh, this is how dumb I am. I said, thank you for the constructive criticism. <laughs> to a Russian porn bot. Yeah, I thought they were saying like, like that I made them want to vomit. And I was like, I don't think I did anything that bad, but maybe, you know. Good to know. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just like, how, how should I handle this? You right, know? yeah. And then I realized it was just somebody trying to get people to go to yeah. porn. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, like, that is such a great thing about getting feedback like that is like, someone will be like, you know, you're too loud or like you are dumb about this. And it makes you go, am I like, let me actually think about if there's validity here. And that drive you insane though. Like, well, okay. So it did, it did a lot at first because it was a lot of self questioning. Like, Oh yeah. my God, there's a lot that I'm doing wrong. And then as time goes on, you're like, okay, I've already gone through the process of realizing that this comment is invalid because I've yeah. come to terms with my own decision here, but it's such a gift. Because what people are doing when they leave you a comment, even if it's mean as hell, <laughs> it, they, I mean, seriously, they are giving you this beautiful gift of an opinion, which could be really, really true. It could also be not, but s filtering out the signal from the noise yeah. and looking at that signal, like uh, some of the it's meanest comments. Way to look at it. It, I mean, yeah, kind of, but some <laughs> of the, out the signal from the noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> that analogy for there, sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like some of the meanest comments I've gotten have given me my best ideas on, on how to fix problems. It's just a matter of like looking past the like kind of aggressive approach and like looking at it for what it is, which is advice. It's free advice. Yeah. Why would you turn that down? I, I've been. Well, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I, it's, it's a beautiful not following way to look at it, it. I love the way that your brain works and I'm, I'm jealous that you can <laughs> do that in a positive And I don't way. follow 99% of it. Okay. It's, it's. It's just that but you still read it. Like you I still it. read it and I still go, is this valid? Is this something that maybe this person's super right and I'm totally off base? That's pretty incredible. And it takes a lot of time and most of the time I'm like, no, I feel pretty good about my convictions here. But like it makes me have to challenge my own assumptions all the time, which is so great. It's, it's, a, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. I've been starting this uh, live stream some of my like design stuff. And then it happens in real time. I'm oh, like laying a trace and someone's like, don't do that. I'm like, 
why? And they're like, oh, that needs to be differential trace. Like you're running a USB line. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm Googling it USB on live. Three? USB at all has okay. to be differentially like I, uh, know, I, I know USB three is like big on that. I, I, I think I think they're you could probably get away with maybe it with two point oh USB three and then USB yeah. two. I, I think like two two point is like lax enough you can do it. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know. I should ask them on you, Twitch. You get lower with a lot of crap on USB two. Yeah. It's slow enough USB you can do it. Is, we've had a lot of people uh, come to SKA and need uh, USB three impedance matched. I mean, it's it's challenging. on a board that you make or something. No, on a board that they made that's not working. Like oh, and get. it's your job to edit it too. Well, a lot of times we get the difficult jobs, so it's it's like somebody else tried and failed, and then they bring in the you know the mercenaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, wow, interesting. So they'll like do something in house design it, it doesn't work, and then they'll go to you and be like... Or another contract engineering firm. But yeah, a lot of times us. Really? Yeah. It's wow. kind of fun, because you get to solve, like, really, really challenging, you know, questions of, like, you know, is this even possible? And, I, I mean, not with, obviously, USB and P's magic, people do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we get, like, crazy timelines where, like, the company came to us, like, at some point uh, last year with, like, a project that they had allotted uh, 18 months to... Okay. And they gave us two. <laughs> All right. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna say what it was, but like, yeah, you know, we had we had two months to do an 18 month project, so <laughs> they had one person. We got seven. Okay, there you go. You know, but but it doesn't scale. Like you can't parallelize exactly yeah. right. So. It's that project manager joke where um, nine pregnant women can give birth to a baby in one month. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's uh, it doesn't work that way. way. Like, <laughs> it just takes nine months. You can't rush it. Yeah. I mean, but it turns out you can in some ways. <laughs> yeah, not not all the way, but yeah, like yeah. you can kind of do it. You can. You just you have to sort of compromise on the right thing. So you negotiate on scope. So first of all, you get you get rid of all the requirements that aren't actually requirements. So you talk <laughs> to your client and you're like, do you really need this? Like, yeah. and and obviously we're happy to develop it for you, you know. But at the same time, you know, we want to hit your timeline. And yeah. So, yeah. If you had to pick, you know, put these in order of priority and, yeah. and say what you want the most and what mm -hmm. you want the least. Yeah. And then we'll focus on the high priority stuff first. And then we'll have other engineers, like anything that can be parallelized, we break out into a separate task. Okay. And then it, it's actually a really fun management challenge. And, and yeah. And there's I, no greater feeling than, than conquering. Conquering like, Honestly, it's like, I hesitate to say this on the air, but it's better than sex for me at this point <laughs> in my life. Like, I, I, I just... just being able to to, <laughs> to manage your team effectively to tackle something that you didn't think was possible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like to, to do something that, that nobody else was able to do it's right like, it's just a, it's such a rush like, I'm, that sounds I'm, bad, but. I want to hear about what that's like for you of like of how the man how do you go about managing like a bunch of people to be more efficient than one person because as I've had some devs working on the index sure. I've realized that having more people does increase the effectiveness of like how much work well, gets done but like I still have mental blocks of like, I need to be doing a lot of the R and D. How, how, in what way do you do that delegation that it's more efficient than just you having the entire project in your head and just buckling down and doing it all yourself? Yeah. I mean, being able to throw money at people helps. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know? But like at the same time, um, a lot of it comes down to knowing what different people are good at and understand the interplay between different individuals on your team. Okay. So, and also knowing like when the human brain is at a limit of endurance and, yeah. and how to give people a rest. So, I mean, there's, right. there's, there's a decent amount to it. And so, um, let's see, what's, what's a good direction? To take how, do, how do you handle communication? This, this is a big one. Like, how do you keep everyone on the team? Let's say you have four other people along with you working on trying to get a thing done. How do you make sure that like, the EE has some pins assigned to a thing and the software person needs to like understand what pins those are and like yeah. if that changes, how does that communication happen? How do you so keep everyone stuff like that? We try to just keep in a, in a global document like a spreadsheet so okay. that everybody knows like which wires do what thing and what pins go where. Okay. Um, with regard to like important interface decisions, we make those in meetings where all parties are present. Okay. And so, and then once the interface is locked in on the software module, we just, we lock it in. You don't make interface changes. If you're going to change something change it's it. downstream yeah exactly yeah yeah um and if you need to make an interface change everybody needs to be involved because that's gonna break everything everything yep yeah 
And so that's that's a big part of it. So um, at the beginning of a project, will you look forward and say, okay, we have these three like infrastructure or like like architecture decisions to make, and they're big locking points. We're gonna we have these three meetings where we're gonna decide on this architecture, and after that, we're not moving forward. Like, do, do you preemptively decide what things like that you need to be able you to lock have in? To. Um, so I first of all, I, I these days in my job, I'm I'm much more of a hardware guy than a software guy. Okay. We have some incredibly smart people running our software teams. Cool. But um, I, I'm I have a computer science degree, but I just I just prefer working on hardware. It's more my passion. Yeah, I mean I told you my whole childhood about it. Yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's 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 what I really really uh, that's what I'm the best at. So, sure. You know that's that's where I, I choose to to spend my my, my talent. Your efforts, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean I, I do oversee at a high level our, our software team, so I have I have a little bit of an idea. So. Mm. I mean, if we're going to do a program and a project in like C versus Python, for I mean C plus plus usually versus yeah. Python. Yeah. That decision is made early on, and and yeah. we have to live with it. Like I mean, yeah. sometimes at the end we find like, you know, well we really should have done that in C plus plus rather than Python because there are all these libraries that you know we'd be able to use. And mm -hmm. it's like, well, sorry, you know, we we've already committed. Yep. And, you know, it's most of the way written, so we don't really get to go back on it. Yeah. But sometimes what you do is you write a wrapper, and then that's kind of how you get around that. It just it just depends on the project. Interesting. And then yeah. after it's that, a little hacky, but it's it's more. Like if you need something out fast, you know, yep. sometimes you have to compromise and, and do something you're not the most proud of in the long run. Mm. And then later on down the line, you go and you refactor sure. and you fix it up and, and sort of, you know, consolidate that technical debt. Yeah. 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 I, um, th at the end of a project, let's say you had that exact thing where you like, you did it all in Python. You're like, or C++ and you're like, we really should have done this in Python or whatever. Probably would have been the other way around. <laughs> um, yeah, correct. Is there a <laughs> Python's always the the easier choice, and C plus well, plus is always like, the like eh, would have been better. The machine learning guys love Python, like the the scientists. Yeah. All like I have a cousin at NIST, and she's all about that Python. You life. have a cousin at NIST? I, yeah, I have a cousin at NIST. That's cool. I didn't know that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that was like something to brag about. Yeah, yeah that's but, pretty rad. She she's way smarter than me. She's like a theoretical physicist. Wow. So, holy yeah, smokes. so her husband is is brilliant as well. Like mm. they're, they're both. Like super duper smart people. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah, um, I, I have a bunch of relatives that are scientists. Yeah, but they're all into the Python. I mean, like well, no, TensorFlow so and like like. I, uh, I have an I have an uncle. Isn't that like a, like my dad's cousin? Is that like a second cousin? I don't know what that would be called. Dad's uncle would be no, a my first cousin, cousin, second once removed. My dad's cousin. My oh, dad's that, that, that's your that's your first cousin once removed. First cousin. So I have a first cousin once removed, uh -huh. who was like one of the first people to get a PhD from the Box Institute. And like in his office, Whoa. he has like the first metal 3D print ever made. What? Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. I'm, I'm being serious. Holy smokes. Like 40, over 40 patents to his name. Like just incredibly smart guy. He was able to explain PID controls to me in 30 minutes when like my, my professor that was supposed to be teaching to me, I just didn't get it. Yeah. Was like, and he was like, Come here for a Let minute. me, I'll just he teach you. He closed the door of the office. Like, in like 30 minutes later, I understood PID control. Yeah, right. I've tuned hundreds at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great. That's so cool. Yeah. And that is, it's odd. The guy's name is Lee. He's like, since retired, I gotta, I gotta call that guy. So. <laughs> but I mean, he, he, uh, he is like really into bioprinting. So like, you know, that like printing scaffolding. Yep. For like, uh, so he's all about that. And then he's got like a crazy 2D printer that does like biological stuff, I think. Really? And it's, it's got linear induction motors for the slides. So it's like if you took a regular motor and unwound Unwrapped it. Unwrapped it. Yeah, that's yeah. how he explained it to me. So some of the uh, big expensive picking places use those. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're so quick. They're and, like, crazy. accurate. They're yeah. quick and crazy accurate. I wouldn't expect them to be, but yeah. they are. <laughs> yeah, they're awesome. Yeah. I mean, controls, man. Like, it's a whole, like, it's, it's just awesome. It's a whole thing. Yeah, I have that's a friend correct. who's doing, like, uh, robotics and prosthetics and, like, biology at MIT right now. Oh, nice. I love that stuff. It's... And like hearing him talk about some of his classes that he's taking are just mind boggling of like, how do you model a muscle? Like in what ways do you actually represent a muscle's behavior mathematically? Probably spring mass damp, I would guess. It is, it is like- For more than that. It, it's, it's way more than that because it's like yeah. your muscle has multiple different modes of being able, like it, it has like 14 different gearing ratios oh, of that and it can choose which ones it wants to articulate for speed or power. Do you, know, do you know a guy named Hart McGuire at Carnegie Mellon? Hart McGuire? Yeah, he's Doesn't like a German bell. dude. No. Um, he, he taught a course, well, there was this course, Manipulation, Mobility, and Controls, that was like the course, the heart of my master's program, which is uh, Master's in Robotic Systems Development. And he, um, he's a brilliant dude. He was like really into uh, biologically inspired robots. And so he had like a lab with a treadmill where the two sides were independent. And then he was doing all this prosthetics work. Cool. 
And yeah, and he was really into gates and like um, like like horses and oh. how they ran versus people and like there were experiments where you could look at the amount of oxygen a horse was utilizing at different gates. Wow. Yeah, like it was it was super cool. That's wild stuff. And it, it was like akin to like a gear shift on a car and you would look at like efficiency. I, I'm not doing it justice because it's not my field. I will look it up later. Yeah, he's, he's, he's an interesting guy. I'll give you his name. I'll spell it out for you. That's Sweet. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. If that, if that one place is still going grab a grab an app or something. We'll Sweet. Talk about it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's that's insane. That's some crazy stuff. It, it is just... Controls is so much deeper than just like... Like, I thought the extent of it was like, oh, you slap a pit loop on it and you call it a day. It's like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's like... And you don't even see those very much in like real hardcore industrial applications because no. it's not advanced enough to do the stuff you need to but do. But like, what do you what do you then use? Like, at some point, you need to take an input and put it through some processing to decide your output to control your input. Yeah. Like, how do you how do you do it if not for a pit? Like, literally, a pit is the only thing I know of like controlling that. And I'm not a Closely. controls expert, but like if you talk to one, they'll they'll tell you about all these other letters in a row that <laughs> do stuff. I mean, you know, and like I, I can tune a PID loop because I've I've done it. It's it's what they taught at my university. Yeah. I mean, I know it pretty well, but like I mean, I know if you start talking to the guys at like Elmo or, or like you know a bunch of other motion controller companies, yeah, they'll start talking all this nonsense about <laughs> you know, yeah. crazy hardcore controls algorithms. You're like, all right, this is way over my head. Take my money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just do it for me, please. I have no yeah. idea what you're saying. Well, yeah, it's, it's like fourteen hundred dollars for an Elmo drive, but like it does everything for you, and they'll hold your hand while you install it. Wow, like it's pretty sweet. So like, I mean, those kind of components make sense on industrial lines, right? Yeah. Or like if, if you just can't afford for it not to work. I mean, yeah. on that, um, well, I, I don't want to get into it, but on a certain project we worked on, uh, we have one of those drives because it's just so reliable and robust. I mean, it's, it's bulletproof. But I mean, a PID can be bulletproof too. Is it, is it about like well, and the I, accuracy I, yeah, and I've, precision? I've, I've tuned or? and programmed hundreds of PIDs. Yeah, so, like, so what was your choice to go with this very much more expensive? We just wanted reliability and precision. Okay, so that you're gonna get that based on is it because the controller itself is really good or is it because their a lot control of was, systems like their methodology is much more advanced than well, it? So the methodology was advanced, um, but I didn't get into how it works super. I mean, I was at such a high level on this project, I didn't yeah. I didn't look at the math or the theory behind how the I controller see. works. So okay, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a good answer to that part of the question. The reason yeah. that I made the decision to go with uh, a higher end motion controller on that particular project was that we just we didn't want to have a confounding variable as to whether or not the motion yeah. controller was, was the cause of an inaccuracy in the system. Yep. And like, I'm sure so looking at a spec sheet too yeah. would be helpful just to see what the precision metrics are for that controller. And it also like... it was, it was the frequency it switched at. So it was 20 kilohertz. Oh, okay. So, um, the human audible range, as you probably know, is uh, 20 hertz 20 hertz to 20, to 20 kilohertz. K? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's the highest end. So you can't hear it. It's, yeah. it's whisper quiet and right. it's quite pleasant because when you're running this machine, it, it's, you know, it just, it's just like, zoom. yeah, <laughs> none of that whining you get from like the, you know, the, sort of the lower end motor controllers. Yeah. So it's, it, it's just super, it's, it's just nice. Yeah. Like, yeah. Know. Yeah. Fair enough. And it's never going to break on you. You never have to worry about like, is that the problem? And if it does, a team of people from that company will descend are gonna, and fix it for you. Yeah, exactly. You know? and so it's You're paying for their stuff. service, too. That's 100%. That's, yeah. 100%. that's probably 70% it. Really? Okay, yeah. interesting. I guess when you have something where it's like, it just needs to work. It just needs to execute. Yeah. It's worth the money to do that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, it's, we have enough other things to worry about trying to do <laughs> things we're hired to do to, to solve a research problem that's very, very complex in of itself. Yeah. To tune, you know, our own loops. I mean, it only takes an hour to tune a PID loop for somebody experienced at it. Yeah. But, or even half an hour, like yeah. I would say at this point in my career. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, I don't want to question my sanity as to whether or not my tuning on that PID loop or my implementation of that PID loop right. is the root cause of failure for a much larger, more complex system. Yep. And, like, if, if you're offloading something as, like, specific as tuning a PID loop to the controller, like... I think so much of what lets people do more stuff nowadays and make more complex things is just like black boxing things and abstracting yeah. things away. You know, yeah, like hundred percent. Like, I mean, like a motherboard could never exist if you didn't do that. Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah. you need to be able to take a thing and be like, I know that this input this gives me this accurate. output. Exactly. And like, if you no longer have to deal with tuning a pit loop, you can focus more on the higher level architecture and doing more complicated stuff with the tool of that closed system actuator that's just going to Which work. Which in of itself is super complex. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But like, you don't have to deal with it. It's done. Yeah. Like, if 100%. I want to like, write a Word document, I can do that on my computer and not care about what transistors are firing and like, yeah, exactly. seg faults and stuff. That just 
is taking care of for me and it lets me do higher level work. Until it blue screens. Until you blue screen. And <laughs> yeah, then... Which is probably a seg fault. <laughs> it's like dumping memory. That's for sure a seg fault. Maybe I'm wrong. I'm sure I don't I'm know. For this. That's a Windows problem. I don't, I don't yeah. deal with that. Well, they don't tell you how it works really. You just kind of have to... Restart. It <laughs> seems like a seg fault. Like I, I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I don't know. I, I like the idea of like modularizing and abstracting things to like... I don't have to... I, I have this whole dichotomy of like, is the thing a tool or a project? Like, do I buy my Mac to have a thing to work on and tinker with? No, I want it to just do what I want it to do. Yeah. If I buy a CNC machine, I might buy it as a project. It might be fun to put it together. It might be fun to play with it and tune it. But I also may just like need to mill out 400 things a day. And like, yeah. I just need it to work for me. Oh, I know people that have spent obscene amounts of money on CNC machines. You and know them too. For them, it's a it's a project. But yeah. for me, it's a tool. I don't want to do well, that. I just want to work for though. They'll spend like, you know, I mean, some of those things are three quarters of a million dollars for a CNC machine. Exactly. Then it should be a tool. It should yeah, exactly. not be a project. Yeah, you don't want that to, yeah. If you have to dick around with wiring that thing, forget about it. Yeah, like, no yeah. thank you. But exactly. like, I, I think that that applies in so many. My rule things. of thumb is if it's on the critical path, I, I don't want it's to be experimenting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Well, I, I mean, you know, and like sometimes you have to experiment. I mean, if you're hired to do a development task that's never been done before, like there is some experimentation inherent in that yeah. a lot of the time. But I would like to, you know, minimize the risk by choosing known quantities or you know just minimize the risk. Yeah. Pick, pick stuff that's tools as much as you have the ability to do and then you know be very selective about where you choose to uh right. to develop and and, and pr pave new ground. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Nice. Minimizing the new stuff and like having fun with it and probably doing that first. So right. once you've done all the R&D of like the unknowns being like, okay, this is where we landed with this. How are we going to structure everything else to facilitate the unknown thing? Cuz all this is known, it's just picking what makes the most sense. Yeah going based on the, the wacky stuff. Well, and there's a bunch of ways you can do that too. I mean, you can do it, you know, traditionally it's done serially. So you try one thing, then you try another thing, then you try another thing. Yeah. You know, iterative, I guess, design sure. is what that's referred to as. Yeah. But then, you know, you and I were talking earlier today about set concurrent engineering. Yeah. Which, you know, we're currently engaged in projects that utilize that approach. Yeah. And Having so, multiple people trying different things and whichever one succeeds, you all run with. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And, or, or like the best aspects of like multiple ones that succeed. True, true, you know, true. You can, you can merge them. Yeah. And so like that's pretty fun. Or like maybe you – there was another episode uh, of, our, of our podcast we recorded where – or of my podcast I recorded, I should say. <laughs> that voice is confusing sometimes. But, um, <laughs> you know, it, it was um, somebody that worked at an industrial automation company where mm -hmm. they were hired to do a $4 million line automation. Okay. And they saw it all the way through and they got paid. Uh, and then the customer didn't use it because they'd hired another automation company to automate a competing product that they were developing internally with a different team of engineers within their company. And they paid another automation firm and the other one turned out to be more viable at market. So they just went with the other one. That's so they insane. took it all the way through production. Yeah. I, that's got to feel like such a letdown to spend all that time paid, and money. Man. I mean, I know, guess you can't so. Take it personally. I guess so. I guess that's and just and how the it machine goes. worked, you know. So it's not like they failed as engineers. Yeah, yeah. They probably learned a lot from it, and like yeah. they made money. And yeah. wow, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I agree. that's like the the classic Google move of like they had like three different teams with three different like messenger apps. Wait, is this true? And then I haven't heard this one. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just like a thing I've heard about the ethos of how Google yeah, tell, operates. Tell me about this. I'm interested. There's like, there's a really great chart of like, what's the company organizational structure for like all like the big the Fang companies? Yeah, and when you say Fang companies. Uh, Facebook, uh, Apple. Um, what's the N? Last one's Google. It's like the big tech companies. I can't remember who the, what that. It's like two A's and NG. I don't remember. It's just like the big tech companies, the yeah. ones with all the money. It's interesting. And Google will like, oh, Amazon is the other yeah. A. Yeah. Like I don't remember what N is. Um, yeah, I wonder too. I'm kind of like, I'm reaching for it. I'll find it. But, um, right. you don't have to. but then Google, Google's will like, they have the core management team. And then there's a spider web out to a whole bunch of all these little small teams. Awesome. And one is like Google Maps and Google Maps is in their own little team and they don't mess with anybody else. And what Google will do sometimes That's is like my friends at Google have described it to me. Yeah. And like, and there's some interaction, but like then there's what Google will do is spin up like three separate teams and they all compete against each other to do the same thing. I love that. And then whichever one works 
I mean, I, I've talked to Googlers about this, and they're like, it sucks to work on a thing for like 18 months and then just get it cut in like with no notice. A but, lot of people really hate that. I don't take it personally anymore. Yeah. And I mean, I can see both sides. Like, I can yeah. see it sucking, but also like, I understand what Google's trying to do by doing that. So, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, I think if they compensate people well, I mean, that goes back to that. Like, you could never do, do. an open source project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that would just be you'd crush somebody's morale and, and it would yeah. be horrible. Yeah. But, I mean, if you do that with, you know, you pay somebody well and you explain to them at the get I mean, this is what I get back to about being ethical. I mean, if you explain to them and you set clear expectations that yeah. you're in competition with these other teams and yours may not get chosen, but if you do really, really good work... And it's you know, the best option. And it's the best option. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you know, it's chosen by either the market or an internal, you know, auditing team or whatever. Yeah. However they're evaluating their stuff. I mean, you know, then, you know, it will see the light of day. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, and I see that and like, I, I, I commend their ability to like move pretty quickly and shut things down. Like I uh, did a lot you of... You kind of have to or you're going to go bankrupt. You do. And, and, and they've been doing quite well. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, they, did, they had Android Things for a while, Google did, which was like um, running Android as an operating system for Internet of Things stuff. It's so they had like the NXP um, IMX7 or like 8M or whatever processor. They supported Android booting on there for um, like running Android as an operating system for Internet of Things specifically. And so I did a lot of work for them for like building stuff around Android things. And like oh, cool. one day they just like pulled the plug and it just, Android things was shut down and, oh, and that was it. And they just turned it off. Well, you were working for Google as an outside contractor. On yeah. 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 I was doing work that I, I was not working as an employee for Google. I was, I mean, that's in some ways more fun. I think I preferred it that way. I would yeah. never want to work for Google. It sounds like a cool place, but it's just not my vibe. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. But, but they just got totally pulled the plug and it's just like, okay, that's done now. You know? I don't know. I'm sure they have their reasons. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure they have their reasons for doing it, but it's very interesting to see from the outside what they decide to pull. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, but you can't do that with open source, you know, like, cause I, I feel like if you're going to decide to be open source, you need to like be super hyper communicative about like everything, because if people are see that the source is open, they're expecting pretty much mostly everything about the thing to be open as well. And yeah, when I try to be communicative with our teams on, on stuff that we're working on, just mm -hmm. out of respect, yeah. I mean, you know, again, it comes back to treat people the way you want to be treated. If yeah. somebody's willing to pour their essence and their, you know, their time and, you know, their heart and soul into something, like, yeah. you'd like them to know, you know, enough about it. First of all, like, to, to feel invested, but secondly, to make good decisions. Yeah. Because, I mean, I mean, you've probably worked with companies that obfuscate away, like, so much that you can't even really make good decisions or do your job as an engineer. Yeah. yeah. And, and that kind of sucks because they're, they're crippling themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have the full picture. It also like... But you're missing out on an insight that could help you. Exactly. And it inspires the why. Like, why am I... Do I care about doing this? Why is this something that I should be passionate about and like want to put my time and heart and energy into? If you don't have that, it's just like for a paycheck, you're only ever going to do exactly what you're asked and like... Maybe not all the time. You can have both, but, I think. Yeah, but like... Well, there's, there was a line. Like, there's some things you can't tell certain details because of... Like sure, that. yeah, not everything. Like, yeah. I understand some obfuscation, but like, you need to kind of be transparent about some stuff to motivate people. Like, I don't know, just have them be able to get on board with the message of the thing that you're trying to do, you know? Yeah. But... Well, that's I, why I like Biomed Life Sciences products that we work on because like, I mean, they're super confidential on lockdown. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can't even say all the stuff we've worked on there. Yeah, most of it. yeah. But it's, it's my favorite domain to work on right now. I'm sure, you know, there may be others at some point in my career. Mm -hmm. But you feel good because you're kind of helping people. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, at the same time, it's, it's fascinating stuff and there's a lot of unpaved ground. I mean, when yeah. you're looking at, like, like robotics and, and medicine and the intersect, I mean, it's so cool. Yeah. Like, where that goes. Um, and I don't know. There's, there's been a few projects where it's just... The, you just get super, I don't know, you feel good about it. And like your team feels good about it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's really cool and the challenges are really interesting, but it's also super secret and you can't tell anyone about it. You can't tell about anyone it. about it. <laughs> it's because a purely internal thing. Because well, it's so expensive and these companies are in competition. Yeah, we worked on something uh, and I, I'm not going to go beyond that about it, but we worked on something and I got a text at the end of it, um, or it was a Slack message from one of the team members and he sent it to the whole team mm -hmm. and it was... Um, you know, it's, uh, I'm kind of sad to be seeing this project finish. I'm proud of the work we accomplished. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, 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 I might have shed a tear or two. When <laughs> it, was, it made me really happy you yeah, know, to, yeah. to have managed that and, and, you know, worked on it and, and yeah. been a part of it. So. it. It helps to have the why. 
Yeah. Having the why helps so much to just be motivated to continue and to like feel good about the work that you do and not feel like it's drudgery or like every job is going to have bad crappy days. And like to know that it's worth putting in the time to get through that crappy day, it it means everything, you know, it makes you not want to just say, screw this, I'm done. I don't want to play this game anymore, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you do see that like, um. I'll be honest, when you're recruiting, you kind of want people that feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> when you're recruiting to like hire people? You mean? Yeah, yeah. When you're bringing people into a project. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you have people that are sort of discontent with their current work and you can give them something a little bit more inspiring. Interesting. Yep. And also treat them a little better. Like, you know, yeah. it feels good because, you know, first of all, they're going to be really grateful and they're going to perform. Mm -hmm. But secondly, you're, you're making their life better. And so, you know, both those are good things. They get to do something they're excited about. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, which is like... Such an important thing. It's such an absolutely incredibly important thing with just like living, I think, is like doing something that you're so excited about. And it's hard to do, but like to be able to do that is just so tremendous. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I still want to ask you about uh, the C++ and Python thing because I'm still super curious about it. And we got on tangents, but I want to ride them out. Uh, what was, can you remind me what the... Absolutely. So uh... you choose C++ and you do it and you're like, ah, crap, we should have picked Python. The end that of the pro yeah, yeah, sorry, other way around. Say that. You choose Python, you're like, crap, we should have done C. And you go and you do you do the project, whatever, and, and you realize that you finish it up. What what do you then take away from that realization for the next project? Like, I know it's not gonna be a blanket, we always pick C, but like do you have like a, a retrospective or like a Sure. No, no, no. Lessons learned are very important. So I think I often say and and uh, older mentor told me this and I kind of internalized it and, mm. and now I kind of quote it a lot, but I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat that mistake. Right. Yeah. And so that's, that's big. I keep a journal of mistakes and lessons learned Okay. and it's a running journal. And every time I, I do something that I regret in business, uh, or, or I guess in engineering, you know, which is the business that I'm in. Yeah. Um, I, I write it down and I, I, sort of get it out and that, that helps psychologically and then I'll like, interpolate lessons from from the experience okay and so um, I have a bulleted list at the top of the journal and I'll I'll usually put like one one time I had three entries in that list um, just based on a mistake but I mean yeah you know the error is human and so yeah. I always try to learn uh, the C++ versus Python is interesting I mean because <laughs> That one is um, that's so specific. I feel like, I mean, there's been so many times when, like, you know, you, you kind of, you can't, you just can't always know. I mean, like, you, yeah. you try to research ahead of time and, and consider the project. And mm -hmm. if it's resource constrained and it's on a microcontroller, I mean, you want something that has lower level and higher amounts of control like C++. Yeah, yeah. If you're working on, you know, you've got all the compute in the world, you've like AWS or something similar, yeah. you know, back, you know, you know, forward Python and, yeah. and maybe time is of the essence. So yep. you don't want to have to do all that stuff. You want to be able to, to move fast. So Python's a better choice. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's true. And, yeah. and the, the, another interesting consideration with that too, is like, you can always make the justification of, Oh, we'll just bang out a quick prototype now to prove the point, And then we'll switch to C plus plus later. But inevitably that doesn't happen <laughs> because you have something that works and no one wants to start. I mean, that's a lot of tech debt to pay. Yeah. If, you, if you have something that works just to prove it. Yeah. Okay. That's great that you have that. But then to then start from, excuse me, to start right. from scratch to do, to do it do the it. right We've way. Had clients come to us with stuff that it technically works. Yeah. It doesn't because they're coming to us, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. Really. It needs to be rewritten and, 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 I mean, the look of devastation when you tell somebody that, I mean, it's, <laughs> I don't enjoy it. I mean, it's, it's not, not, not pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it needs to be done sometimes, you know? And it so. does. Yep. But like, how do you ensure that that doesn't happen? Like, I guess the best way is to do exactly what you've done, which is write down as many lessons learned as possible yeah. and, and then stick to that bulleted list. And I try to keep it really sparse because it's. It's a long list. I've maybe got like 27 bullet points on there now. Nice. You should publish those bullet points as like a... Not yet. I've spent too much work and I'm in competition. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm ready to retire, maybe that'll all get published. <laughs> just just share with me. I promise I'll never compete with you. <laughs> as long as you never build a pick and place, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> but if a client wants us to build a pick and place... It, all my stuff is open source. You can just steal it anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I wouldn't 
steal it, right? I mean, I'm sure your license requires you to open source the derivative. Uh, part. yes, we use GNU GPL v3, yeah. which does require that any like modifications need to be shared and like all that stuff. And you know that would be unethical, right? So, like, I mean, we have been approached, you know, for like jobs, like to like to to rip off Arduino libraries and stuff, you know. Mm. And people people ask for that. Yep. <laughs> yep. Because they see it out there, they see it working, they want it for themselves. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it, it is it is funky. And it's also hard because how can you prove for sure that someone didn't use an Arduino library in their firmware? Like, who's going to decompile the binary and check to see... Even if they do, it's difficult to... To even tell if it's that it. library specifically. Correct, decompiling doesn't give you a good look at what's really going on. The actual library. Like, yeah, maybe there's some there. things. Yeah, yeah. So, like, but how There's multiple you... ways to get to that... that assembly language maybe maybe if it were like exact and you did like a hash function or something right you could probably verify yeah yeah but like there's really no way to prove that so i think a lot of like open source licenses just kind of get steamrolled over because who's going to check to see the who, even if you could, could check who's going to know that it's that when firmware? we do a cl closed source project we go out of our way to make sure we're not infringing on, on any i kind feel of like that's impossible like there's so many open source things like I mean, How do you do that? If, if it's been done before and like we didn't see it, of course you can you can miss something. Yeah, yeah and that's that's for sure. But what I'm saying is we don't we don't like go and take open source stuff and scope it in and then hide sure. it. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, no, no. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I feel like that's got to be quite a challenge to like do that the right way. You know. It like, is. It's incredibly difficult, and a lot of engineers don't seem to understand it. Well, because because why would they? That's not their job. I mean, that's it's like a lawyer's job. I mean, you, yeah. you know. But as an engineering program manager, it's my job <laughs> yeah. to do that research yeah, no and, kidding. and make sure that there's no infringement. It's it's incredibly challenging. I mean, it, you kind of feel like a lawyer sometimes mm. and, and you do have to close down paths and patents are even more difficult than like, like oh. source code because I mean, it, you know, it's, a, it's a big world out there. There's a lot of things patented. How you know? do you check that? How do you make sure that like, I feel like everything in its mother is patented. Like, yeah, how do right you? About that. How do you make well, sure? Dude, I, I saw one the other day that was um, it was a device for exercising a cat. Have you seen this? <laughs> it was a laser pointer used in an application of of a cat being Get interested. out of here! I, I'm not even lying to you, but it was expired, right? And okay, so that, good. That's that's the the silver lining of some of those patents is they only last 15 to 18 years, mm. and so you know, okay. like, I mean, you know, you're eventually. But I mean, that's the other thing is, is if you don't make money in 18 years, you're not going to make money on it. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, like, so you, know, you got to move in, in business. There's the quick and then there's the dead. And that sounds cold, but yeah. at the same time, it's, if in 18 true. years, like it, it, if having, having a monopoly on a thing for 18 years does not give you an it's edge. It's not a true monopoly. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you can still kind of do the same thing in a different way, I correct. guess. Like that 45 degree angle you were talking exactly. about. Exactly. Like you can still kind of get cheeky with it, but you know, what I like I about know. that though is it's not just a workaround. It's also adding value. It's a feature. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bug. It's, it's a feature. A, it's a genuine feature though. It really is. And yeah. like, uh, uh, the one fact that the conveyor is an access is super cool to me. It is cool. And at first when I saw it, I was like, is it going to wobble? Is it going to... It's good. Right, actually? It's really... It's like... Yeah. It does... Um, one of my friends, Justin... I would have thought backlash would be an issue with that, but... It only ever moves one direction. It never moves backwards. Ooh. So you don't ever have to worry about it. That's awesome. It's pretty cool. Aside from the weird support thing, it like... My friend Justin's printing... Um, he got a Kickstarter unit and he's printing a Keyblade from Kingdom Hearts. And he printed like... It's a print this long. <laughs> and it's, it's the most incredible thing ever. It has weird issues on the print in like weird places you would not expect but it's a keyblade like this long in one print and it's printing at 45 degrees <laughs> yeah yeah 100 <laughs> percent. it's the craziest stuff dude but yeah i mean that's a great way to work around the patent you know you find a way you end up getting like a cool thing out of it too yeah that must have been that eureka moment where they came up with that idea can you can you even imagine just the amount of champagne that was probably popped <laughs> <laughs> i think they actually looked at another designer i forget the guy's name but he made a printer called the white knight which is like effectively <laughs> the same name. thing and it's like um it's like a core xy head and then the belt 45 degrees same thing and then creality like worked with him to build their printer That's um cool. yeah it was cool they, like, they cut the guy in yeah they cut the guy in they also worked with the guy who runs marlin the firmware the 3d printer firmware to like make a custom build of marlin for the CR30. So like they brought in yeah, the they community. They these people, you know, they, they, they did it right. Like, I think they did it a yeah. really cool way. And I think if they hit a certain Kickstarter threshold, they're going to make the printer open source too. Like 
But that's pretty neat. So like they're just like, look, if we get enough money, we've we've covered our NRE and we've earned a profit. Yeah. So you know, yeah, we'll put it out there. Yeah. And how many people really go out of their way to make the thing from source? Like, it's such a minority of people. I think. Well, I, I think the bigger concern is like a competitive company. But I guess if you use that's the right true. license, that's and true. You have the lawyers to enforce it because that's a big one. Is if you can't enforce, like, who cares? You, then it doesn't. Yeah, I, I always I always misremember that. That's such a big part of it. Like. I think the amount of people that actually go out of the way to build it themselves is such a r- small part of like lost profit, and it's such a huge boon in terms of user feedback of yeah. early adopters. It well, makes I also so much think sense. it's goodwill as well. Like a lot yeah. of the time, with at least the three D print community is, is a big open source proponent. Like, yeah, it depends on your market because some markets would look at that as a negative, right? So, like, if you're looking at, for instance, like industrial automation or biomedical, they would not want to do business with anyone that wants to open source what they're selling them right. because they lose their competitive advantage that they paid for. Yeah. Our clients a lot of the time would not want that. But yeah. I look at the clients or the customers, I should say in this case of 3d printers. And I mean, that's huge. That's great. I mean, those people are big proponents and contributors a lot of the time to the open source community. And so it's good for business to yeah. open source. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It's a, it's a weird thing, <laughs> yeah. but I it's mean, cool. I, I agree. And, and that's something that took me a long time to, to kind of come to terms with and, and you know, yeah. get on board with. But, I mean, I don't know. Like, we talk about it. It's all good. You know, there's no <laughs> right way. <laughs> there's not. You just, you do what, yeah. what makes the most sense for what goal you're trying to accomplish. 100%. And like, some people, their goal is to, like, get out ahead two weeks before their competitor. Yeah, you want to close that stuff up. Absolutely. You know, but, like... If some company rips off my pick and place design yeah. and is making them in bulk way faster and better than I ever could, that, yeah, like I, that still kind of accomplishes my goal because I want to get pick and places out there for cheap. If another company does it, that's still kind of accomplishing my goal. The fact that my source helped establish that, heck yeah, I can still work on the design. I that's make awesome. enough money from YouTube stuff that I can sustain myself. Why not? You know, I mean, I want to make them too. Mm-hmm. I think that would be really fun and a total bass and I want to care about the quality of the thing I put out the door. Yeah. But ultimately, it's a good thing for the community and for the goal I'm trying to accomplish. But That's it depends awesome. on the goal, you know? For sure. No, I, I agree. Yeah. And I mean, it, it's such an interesting thing being a contract consulting engineer because m- my objective is, is to represent my client's interests. Yeah, that's true. It's almost like being a lawyer. <laughs> and so it's, it's like... Yeah. Y- that's that's my morals now. It's like whatever the client wants. I mean, assuming it's not something heinous, right? <laughs> right, sure. So it's like, okay, I'm not getting involved in that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, assuming that I, I agree ethically with what my client is doing, at least at a, at a base level, you know, then, then my job is to protect their interests. You yeah. Know, however, you know, those may manifest. And yeah. So it's, it's, it's kind of a fun empathy game because you, yeah. you get to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And think like, you know, what would they want, you know, or like, what would they do? And, right. And how can we act in such a way that, that furthers that goal? It's in line. And I mean, you, you know, like as an extrovert, it's kind of nice to, to just do good things, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's another way to do good for others, right? It's just another yeah. way to, to further, you know, somebody else's, you know, to make people happy. And, sure. And yeah. More fulfilled and, and more money in their pocket. Right. Do you find that it's like difficult to context switch between different clients that may have different expectations of SKA as like in terms of confidentiality and like how things operate and like, like I feel like it would be a lot to keep track of a bunch of different clients that all have different opinions on how things work and like, how do you manage that? It can be a little bit challenging. Um, we try not to take on too many projects at one time. I, I think, or if we do, you know, usually like, I mean, I don't manage all of them. So, I mean, at, at a high level, I mean, I have, I have final say on, on pretty much everything we do, but we do have, um, you know, a bunch of really, really gifted managers that, that run these things. And that helps a bit just to have some compartmentalization. There. Sure. Yep. Um, they're handling and, more of the small minutia of like individual clients and stuff. Yeah. Well, or like, engineers on an individual project or, or like you said the clients so that would be account management that you're describing there yeah yeah um and um you know that, that's all important um and and at some level i i, I kind of know everything that's going on with the company because it's it's my job to hmm. but i don't know i mean you, you kind of have to get in gear it, it maybe it's like a 15 minute context switch where you, you just think about you know or maybe you refer back to the contract that's oftentimes really okay. the informative document i mean when you yeah, I mean, if, if several years have passed, right, and you have to look at, like, 
uh, clients' interests because it, it comes back up or they want something else or something happens that's related with another client that might, you know, be a conflict of interest and you have to consider. Mm -hmm. It's always the contracts that become the, the I guess, the, the prototype for, for the client's intention. And, sure. And your the North Star. Your the, the goal. North, that's, that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it sets the, the pace for the entire relationship. Sure. And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's often overlooked, I think, by people in the engineering discipline in particular. I mean, myself, I would include in that. Although, I mean, obviously, it's a big part of my job. So yeah. It's something I've gotten quite good at. But the contracts are important, uh, not necessarily just for enforceability, but also for understanding intent. Yeah. I mean, I, I've not been in a contract negotiation that's lasted this long, but I've been told about contract negotiations since I've got 18 months. Oh, and wow. But... The positive of that is that at the end of that 18 months, you know, assuming you kick off, both parties <laughs> understand each other's intentions very, very well. So clearly, yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, just going through that, I mean, while it seems like a battle, I mean, it's kind of nice in the sense that it's a form of communication. And so by the end of it, I mean, you know exactly what everybody wants and, and would accept yeah. and uh, is, is okay with. Right. And, and, you know, when you come to head, you know, with, with uh, another party in a contract negotiation, oftentimes what comes up is, and I've been critiqued for like, you know, like maybe spending a little too much energy on contracts sometimes. Like <laughs> our mutual friend, Kristen brought that. She's like, oh really? She's like, you're like, you know, the guy whose name starts with that with regard to swag. He, he spends too much time on his swag. You spend too much time on contracts. <laughs> you know, and I'm like. Those are two great things to spend time yeah. on. Swag <laughs> and contracts are important parts. Yeah, but, like, <laughs> you know, it's good to put this into words because, you know, I, I think one of the reasons contracts are so important is because, you know, it's it's a vehicle for understanding intention. And, right. And what I was getting to with that is when you get to a sticking point, you know, like we want to strike, you know, section A, you know, subsection one point, you know, Roman numeral three or whatever. I'm yeah. making it usually it goes uh, regular number letter than Roman numeral. Yeah. But, you know, um, <laughs> basically. Yeah. It's... Um, you know, you ask why. You say, you know, why do you want to strike that? And they say, well, because, you know, we have a lien against us and we can't actually put our stuff up as collateral or because our client is the U.S. government and if we made anything in China, we're going to end up in, you know, Levensworth. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. We don't want you to end up going to prison forever. Let's <laughs> not make stuff in China, you know? <laughs> so, That's an easy one. It's stricken. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, you get a lot of stuff out, you know, yeah. and, and, and it, it kind of, it's, it's a, just a great way to, to understand where people are coming from and why. Yeah. I mean, it really is the written, it's the written agreement of business. It's yeah. exactly what is the nature of your relationship with the client? It, you know, in a written form, in a hard textual written form, that's really interesting. I like the idea of using a contract as like yeah. ground truth. If you want, I'll help you with it sometime. Well, I would love to chat just like yeah. contract drafting at yeah, some we can point. Do that. I mean, like off the off the record, I'll, I'll do that with you. I would point. love to hear. I'm no just, lawyer. I'm not great. I know. At I know. I know. Yeah, I, I, I will hold you accountable for that. But my just mom's to hear a corporate litigator, though. So I, I've really I've had a lot of mentorship in that area. Oh wow, yeah. that's pretty cool. My dad's a lawyer, but not that's in awesome. like corporate anything. Um, what does he do? What's his area? He works, uh, he's in like charities. So like people that oh, cool. will like have a charity and they like, instead of taking all the money and like putting towards a charity, they get like deep tissue massages and buy nice cars <laughs> and stuff. He like hunts those fuckers down, like takes nice. them out. Yeah. That's it's awesome. really cool. It's like very satisfying work. He like reclaims money for the charities and like, that's cool. It's kick ass. Yeah. It's well, there's sweet. so much corruption. I feel like in the not for profit world, oh, unfortunately. It's so, okay. It's so funny because he'll like, you know, when you go to the grocery store and there's people that will be by the entryway, like, you know, like looking for a donation or something. Yeah. My dad goes into it and like, and he works for the state. So he like, it's oh, cool. like legal wise that he like, like in terms of like, what is the government saying That's about pretty this? good because that, that sort of mig mitigates conflict of interest. I mean, I wouldn't 100%. say eliminates because there's corruption within the government of course, but yeah, but like mitigates the, the, the yeah. goal of his department is to retain money for the charity yeah, that's cool. and there's really no, like whether or not they do it or not, it doesn't change like how much he gets paid. So it's pretty, pretty, you know, separate from inclination. Uh, yeah. but, but he'll go up to like all the people at the, who'll be like, so what charity are you? And they'll be like, oh, we're this. And he's like, interesting. Uh, so tell me a little about like, where does the money go? What's the distribution method? And he like asked them all these questions about the charity and they're like, wow, 
this person's really interested and they're like joyfully telling all about this thing and he's like cool thanks and then he just walks away (laughs) and they're like wait we totally thought we were gonna get a donation he's just like just checking in and off he goes (laughs) it's so funny he'll stand there for like 15 minutes like reeling him in and then off he goes that's funny it's so funny it cracks me up every time he doesn't mean to do it he's just like he's curious it's his job you know he wants to know well you when you when you're passionate about something i feel like you nerd out yeah and, and yeah, you're just you just kind of go into gear really quick. Like, I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do and that with engineering does. stuff. I'll, I'll grill people, but like I don't even I don't even really mean to. I'm just so curious. Like, yeah. I want to know more. Yeah. I, I have a, <laughs> a relative who's like a former Fortune 500 CEO, and I mean he'll go into like you know like uh, you know a bar and he'll run the numbers in his head and figure out how many tables they're trying. He'll like count. You know, <laughs> like, he's retired now, but the, you know, he'll, he, his mind just works that way. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and he'll figure out like what they're making a year and what their, you know, overhead probably is. I'm like, yeah. what could put them out of business? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah it's, That's wild. That guy's brilliant. You know, and so, you just get wired for that stuff. If you yeah. like it, your brain's always on it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I do it too. I mean, I was at the Cooper, Cooper Hewitt museum with my dad. Yeah. Like maybe a few years ago. And I remember we had a game where I was like figuring out what things did before he could read the plaque <laughs> to design museum and so it's my job is you know like yeah, engineering yeah. design so that's so often cool. I, I beat him at it like most of the time i was i was faster at just figuring out from examining the mechanism and figuring out you know <laughs> that's so cool and they were not i mean you know most people wouldn't have been able like it was a little bit cryptic in some cases but yeah I mean, you know if you've been around enough machines and it's, you can tell what's going on yeah yeah been working on hundreds of them. You know, yeah, so. yeah. You know a thing or two about machines. A thing or two about a thing or two. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> yeah, mo- most of my family is all like musical and English related. That's cool. And then I have a couple uncles who are super, super technical. Nice. And so when we get on like a family call, they're like, Stephen, what are you doing? What are you working on? And I'll like bring up a, like a very light technical thing. And one of those uncles will ask me a question. I'll be like, and then inevitably, no I just like we just have a back and forth, and like everyone else is just like, okay, we, Eyes we don't know what's over. going. Yeah, it was like <laughs> yeah. you guys, come on, cut it out, and like, oh, okay, sorry. And inevitably, that happens, but it's hard to not when you talk about something you're excited about. How can you not just carry on through it? You know, it's so fun. Yeah, no, I agree. I've got um, so like one half of my family is like all business people, mm-hmm. and the other half is like all scientists and doctors. <laughs> cool. And so yeah, it's neat, but like they definitely come to head at points, like because <laughs> the, the you know the the science people are a little bit more like, I don't want to say idealistic, but like, ult- maybe not altruistic. Either. I mean, they all are altruistic. Like they try to do good by, by society. Mm-hmm. They just have a different way of doing it. I think. Yeah. 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 I think everybody, unless you're a sociopath, right? You want to make the world <laughs> nicer and you, and you want to be good to people. Yeah. But I mean, then some people are that, right? But yeah. like at the same time, like it's just the way you perceive is the best way to make humanity a little bit nicer. Yep. Do you perceive it through like an interpersonal relationship and business way, or do you receive perceive it through like a development and scientific discovery way? Yeah, like or like you know psychology, like you know just yeah. making people feel better, right. or literature, like improving art. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, like there's so many different ways to to improve people's lives. I mean, you know, yeah, just, I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. And, and then there's ways to scoop people over. Like there's there's just predators out there that I think are just out to. Mm-hmm. You know, like in not. any one of those fields too, you know, sure. like yeah, yeah. no matter what you do, there's two, ver- there's two axes. There's, there's not really an axis. It's a, you know, scale of like what, you know, thing are you interested in? What passion do you have? And are you, you know, um, malicious, bene- or... malicious or are you benevolent in that, in that yeah. endeavor? You know, that's funny. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. No, this is, I didn't think we were going to go down that path, but I really like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Should we cut it there? I feel like it's a perfect place to end it. I think that's a perfect place to end it. Sweet. Well, cheers, man. That was fun. Cheers, yeah. Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that will let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're going to put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much. You're the best. <laughs>